I feel this in my bones, people. For you, I'm feeling it. I'm telling you. We've got to display the ministry of the Spirit today. Something that is so incredibly powerful to change the world. We must not lose today's opportunity to reach the whole world for Jesus Christ. This is your love world.
say so today. What a great God. Thank you, Love World Singers. I don't know when I've heard you sing better. What an anointing. And I can tell you, I've been preaching 42 years this July. I've never been in a more majestic, dignified auditorium in my life. What a, what a sanctuary of the Lord. I love what you've done here. We want to welcome all of you from watching around the world, joining us on every continent. We're live here from Lagos, Nigeria, and God is here. And we are thrilled that you're with us today. It's going to be a bad, bad day for the devil. I can promise you that. Bad, bad day. And Jesus is going to be exalted, and we're going to go higher and higher and higher. It's a joy to see all of you here. I can tell you I've never seen more beautiful faces and anointed hearts in my whole life. So I'm so glad to be back in Nigeria as well. We're all honored to be here. We're so thankful. Pastor Chris, our dear man of God, thank you so much for allowing us the privilege of being here and being a part of what God is doing through you all over the world. We're so glad to be here. Pastor Benny is here. He's flown in with us. We're so thankful and glad to be with him. Dr. John Avanzini is here. You'll be hearing from him in just a few minutes. Oh, my good friend, Pastor Dan Willis is here. He's going to be here all week. Bishop Clarence McClendon is here. You've already heard from him. You'll be hearing from him more. Bishop James Payne is here. We're so thrilled. We've got special friends that will be singing and ministering all week long. I'm Dr. Mike Smalley, and I'm honored to be here with all of you today. And uh, I want to just say back here, we have a, a, an expression in America. You probably have it here, too. When your friends are talking about you, they say, I've got your back. If something bad happens, I've got your back. So when I look who's behind me right now and who's got my back, I'm really honored. Oh, it's so good to be with Reverend Ray. He was the first person I met when I came to Nigeria several years ago. I got to meet Reverend Ray, one of my dear friends. And I have a special place in my heart for evangelists. And we have our evangelists right here. And I've often said before in the Bible, the Bible warns us of false prophets warns you about false apostles, warns you about false pastors and teachers, but never says anything about false evangelists. Have you ever noticed that? I just have to say. So we're so honored as well. Dr. Avanzini's grandson, Jason, is here with his beautiful wife, Jessica. We're honored to have them. They travel all over the world. They just got back from Asia and so many other countries preaching the gospel, and they are. Uh, walking in the anointing of their grandfather and we're going to be so thankful to have them here this week as well so listen don't miss a single one of these teachings this week you're going to set your DVR if you can't watch it live don't miss anything matter of fact right where you are right now take out your phone and text three people just do it right now grab your phone you can do it here right here in the live audience there at your house text three people and tell them how you're watching right now we could triple the size of this audience in just seconds by inviting three other people to be a part of what the Holy Spirit's doing through these broadcasts don't miss all day long we're going to be teaching and preaching the gospel and focusing on completing the Great Commission this is our praise-a-thon week where we're sowing seed to help finance the Great Commission. That's one reason it's going to be a bad day for the devil because out of this special week is not only going to come your harvest from sowing seed, but the gospel is going to continue to go all around the world through the leadership of our man of God, Pastor Chris. And Pastor Chris, like Aaron and her holding up the hands of Moses, we're standing with you, sir, holding up your hands, and we're going to be able to say one day to the Lord, we brought completion to the Great Commission. If you believe it, somebody shout a big amen in God's house today. We're going to get this done. We have the technology. We have the anointing. We have the passion. And we have the need. So why can't we in our lifetime say to the Lord, every language, every nation, every tribe, every tongue has now heard the good news of Jesus Christ. And let's usher back in the return of the King. Come on, give God one more shout today. You believe it. So we're so thankful. So listen, you're going to be hearing from the Love World singers and choir. And I want to just look, I'm looking over here at the beautiful robes on this side of me over here. And I've got beautiful family of God all out in front of me here come on we, we we're gonna make the devil so upset he'll never come near Nigeria again amen we're gonna do it so I want to pray a prayer and then I'm gonna have you be seated then Dr. Avanzini is gonna come matter of fact Dr. Avanzini would you just come and bring your notes and come stand here next to me right now let's let's welcome this dear general of the faith <laughs> Dr. John Avanzini has been preaching over 50 years 
And what a wellspring of wisdom. Whenever I get anywhere close to him, I promise you I do two things really fast. One is I, I shut up, and two, I start listening. What is he going to say? What am I going to hear? What am I going to pick up on? What am I going to glean from? Wisdom is the ability to discern difference. Difference in a moment, difference in an opportunity, and today's unlike any other day we've had in quite a while. We get to sit at the feet of this man of God and hear what he's got to say about God's provision and God's abundance, and to whom much is given, much is required. So we're going to learn today and implement what we hear so we can go to the next level in kingdom finance and not only be a blessing to the work of God, but to our own selves and our family. Come on, somebody give God a big shout of praise if you think our Father has something for us. So I want you to stretch your hand out toward the pulpit of God. You that are watching there at your home, I, want, I don't know if you're watching from your house on a handheld device. Maybe you're watching on your regular television. Maybe you're on a business trip right now. You're waiting to catch a plane, but you're watching on the Love World app. I don't know how the Holy Spirit's made it possible for you to hear my voice and hear the voice of the man of God, but you have capitulated into the center of God's will for your life right now because the Lord knew you'd be listening at this moment. Whether you're watching live or on a replay later, this is the word of the Lord for you. Because the Lord knew you would be watching, and so he's put a word in the man of God's mouth. I'll be ministering a little bit later, and God's put something in our heart for you. Because God knew you'd be watching, so stretch your hand out to me now. Father, in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, we sanctify these few moments for the hearing of your word. We are receivers today, we're hungry today, and we're thankful. We say a big thank you for the privilege of hearing a man of God who's preached over 50 plus years all around the world and you've brought him here with us and for those of us who are blessed to be physically here in the room with him and others who are watching all around the world we thank you for the privilege of hearing what you put in dr john avanzini we're going to hear we're going to respond in a few moments we're going to plant seed we're going to wrap our expectation around that seed and we decree today is the poorest day we'll ever be the rest of our life we're going into a new dimension for you and your glory and we thank you and we give you praise. Bless and anoint our man of God as he speaks and shares. In Jesus' name, amen and amen and amen. Let's show our appreciation for Dr. John Evanzini. God bless you, sir. Wow. Tell that person next to you that Brother John thinks they look very nice today. Would you do that? You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. What a lovely transformation you've done in this room. I love the clouds. I, I love walking in the clouds. And you're seated. And as I want to talk to you today about putting your eyes into miracle mode and putting your mouth into miracle mode. Uh, you know, the Bible says you have a measure of faith. Every person has a measure of faith. Romans 12, 3, for I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God had delivered to every man the measure of faith. Now, some translations say a measure of faith, but God is not a respecter of persons. I believe there is in you a measure of faith. Now, you have either been in the process of strengthening that measure of faith or you've been not strengthening it, you've been ignoring it, and it's not grown. David grew his faith very strong, even strong enough to slay a lion and a bear. And this was not done with the tools that they hunt with now, the high-powered rifles. He did it with his bare hands. First Samuel 17, 34 through 36 says, And David said unto Saul, Thy servant keeping his father's sheep, but there came, uh, uh, said unto Saul, uh, thy ser as he's now telling Saul, I'm able to kill this giant, and here's my proof. He says, I kept my father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock. And the 35th verse lit up to me, and I went out after him. When, he, when Satan comes and touches anything of yours, the thing you need to do is take off after him and take back what he's taken from you and smote him and delivered it out of his mouth 
and when, uh, when he, and, and when he arose again, he knocked him down. He got up and caught him by the beard and smote him and threw and, and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised, this no covenant Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defiled the armies of the living God. Notice something strange happens to David's faith. Here's a bear slayer. Here's a lion slayer. And all of a sudden something takes place that is so out of place because in the 24th verse, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, first Samuel, uh, oh yeah, first, I'm looking first at first Samuel 17, 22, as David appears uh, at the battle where Goliath is. And it says, and David left the carriage in the hands of the keepers of the carriage and ran into the army and came and saluted his brethren. And as he talked with them, behold, there came up the champion of the Philistines of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines, and spake according to the same words, and David heard them. Now that word, David heard them, the Greek word means gave heed. He paid attention to what the devil's saying, and the moment you pay attention to what the devil says, it's going to draw the faith out of you, and you're going to be vulnerable to attack. 24th verse, and all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, now this includes David, fled from him and were sore afraid. Fear has torments. Anytime you go into the fear mode, your faith more tone turns off. The same thing in you where faith is generated is the same place that fear is generated. And they cannot both come forth at once. One has to be put down or the other one will rise up. And, uh, uh, and the men of Israel said, have you seen this man? that is come up surely to defy Israel is he come up and it shall be that the man who kills him, the king will enrich him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free. He'll be tax free. He'll marry the beautiful princess. He'll have all the money that he wants. And all of a sudden this fear that had left David, something changes because you must be reward motivated if you're going to have the power of God functioning in your life and people say, oh, I, I don't do anything for God for a reward. You better not have that attitude because the uh, second Corinthians 10, five says casting down imaginations and every high thought that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity, every thought into the obedience of Christ. You had better take that fear when that fear rises up and you better know how to speak to it and bring it into order. First Samuel tells us uh, in uh, the 30th chapter and the sixth verse, and David was greatly distressed. This is a time many years after this when David is in the camp and there's been a great defeat has taken place with his armies. And just to show you how David deals with his faith, it says, and the people spake, uh, uh, spake of stoning David because the son, souls of all the people was grieved every man for his son and for his daughter. But David encouraged himself in the Lord. Child of God, there's got to be some times in your life when you're going to have to be the one that encourages yourself in the Lord. There might not be someone around to take and give you a pep talk, but when the devil arises as David has now had it happen and they've run away and he's got caught up with fear, he better be able to step in and start talking to yourself and bring yourself into control and start taking dominion over the situation because there's not always a promise that somebody will be there to strengthen you. You have to know how to encourage yourself. And here's what happens in that first Samuel 17. Now we come back in the very first part of David's victory as he stands in that place where Goliath is. He says, and David spake to the men that stood by him saying, what shall be done for the man that killeth the Philistine? The, he's hiding behind a rock with everybody. And finally he says, uh, uh, tell me again, what happens to the man that defeats his lion, uh, this, this giant? They said, well, he's going to marry the beautiful princess. He's going to be tax free. He's going to get a lot of money. And then David said, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. I didn't realize there was a reward. And when he heard there was a reward, he said, let me have another look at this giant. And, and uh, said, what does he say? Then he speaks to himself and he says, for who is this no, fi no covenant Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? 
David encourages himself. He speaks up and he points out the fact that this man that faces him might be big, but he does not have a covenant with Jehovah and that he has a covenant with Jehovah and a small man with a covenant uh, with Jehovah can defeat a large giant that is standing there uncircumcised without a covenant. Are you grasping what's about to happen in this situation? Things are getting ready to drastically change. And the king is the one that provided that. He said there is a, there is a reward put out. I have people, and I remember from the denomination that I was in years ago, a pastor there, it was wrong to say that you were reward motivated. You did things because you loved God. You didn't do anything for a prize. But I'm telling you right now, I thank God I got out from that bunch of losers and I got with some people that understand what the Bible says. And now every time I move out for God and do something for God, I get rewarded. Offering time comes. I'm not just seeing to him that the roof is patched on the building, but I'm also seeing that the roof is good over my building where I live. God is a God that is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. Now, you know what happens now. Uh, you know that it comes to the point to where Goliath is slain. I'll not go into all of that story. His head is cut off and David stands victorious. Now here's something about the Goliath you have to understand. Most people, when you look at that Goliath in your life, you see a big guy, you see a big problem that's in your way. But you have to realize Goliath was a kingmaker. David would have never been king if it hadn't been for Goliath. It wasn't, it wasn't God's call him to be the king that made him the king, but it was when Goliath stood up and he overcame Goliath and standing in your way any moment, a Goliath can rise up. Don't look at the size of that Goliath. Look at the victory that lays on the other side. God is getting ready to turn something good in your life. I like that saying, Oral Roberts used to use it a lot. He said, something good is about to happen. Somebody say something good is about to happen. The Bible tells us she did not have anyone come witness to her. There wasn't any healing seminar that took place. But in Matthew 19, 20 and 22, and the, uh, it says, And behold, a woman which was diseased with an issue of blood 12 years came behind him and touched the hem of his garment. For she said within herself, she looked and she saw others being healed. She looked and she saw others being saved. She looked and she saw others being delivered. And she said within herself, she didn't wait for the invitation time. She jumped up and ran through the crowd. And even with uh, the disease that she had, the issue of blood, she was not allowed. She was not allowed to get in the crowd. But sometimes some rules have to be broken. Sometimes you have to put the world's plan aside and the world's a way of doing things aside and move out into what God tells you to do. Inside her heart, she hears, I'm going to get healed if I touch the hem of his garment. But Jesus turned him out and said, who was it that touched me? And he said, I felt faith go out from me. Child of God, know this. Life and death is in the power of the tongue. And it's not just in the power of the tongue with those that you speak to, but it's in the power of the tongue that you speak to yourself. I've had people say, Brother John, you mean you talk to yourself? I talk to myself all the time. I'm continuously in conversation with myself or with the Lord. And, and you say, well, Brother John, is, well, you talk to everything anyway. I mean, the car won't start. You start talking to it. Come on, baby. Come on now. You can start. It is not a strange for people to talk to themselves, but talk about the right things. Bring up the things of God. Bring up the promises of God. Confront the devil with what God says is going to happen, not what he says is going to happen. Are you learning anything? Let me show you just how powerful your mouth is and your eyes become when you shift them into miracle mode. I don't know whether you realize this or not, but you can shift your eyes into miracle mode and you can see what God sees. You can shift your mouth into miracle mode and begin to speak what God once said. Over in John 4, 35, the Bible says, Say, ye, say not ye there are four months, and then comes the harvest. Listen, if you say four months to the harvest, you've told the truth. It, it says harvest comes in four months. 
and there's 12 months in a year. So you have the potential for three harvests. As long as you allow the world systems to function and bring the blessing to you, it'll come to you measured. It'll come to you seldom. It'll come to you a few times a year, but you can lift up your eyes and see the fields white under harvest. You don't have to wait till harvest time to have a harvest because you can move your eyes into miracle mode. And in miracle mode, you can see the fields white under harvest. And every day you can lift up, even after a harvest, you can look up if you've planted seed. Now you can't see a harvest if you haven't planted seed. But if you've planted seed, you can lift up your eyes and you can see that the fields are once again white under harvest. I thank God that you can have 10 harvests a year. You can have 50 harvests a year. You can have 100 harvests a year. And I've had now a good friend of mine, a bishop in uh, California. He plants a seed a day and it's been going on for years. And now he has a harvest every day. He can bear testimony. He plants a seed every day, has for years. And now there is exceeding abundantly above all he can ask or think. It's out there for us. Listen, Jesus continuously spoke the word of the, uh, the works, spoke the, the words of the father. You don't just have to speak your words. You can speak the words that God spoke. In John 12, 49, in the New King James, it says, For I have not spoken on my own, Jesus says, authority. But the Father who sent me gave me a, communi and gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. Jesus said, when you hear me talking, it's not me talking. It's the Father talking. And so you don't have to say what you have on your mind. You can say what God has on his mind for you. John 5, 19, Jesus gave them the answer. Verily, truly, I tell you, the son of man can do nothing of himself. He can only do what he sees the father doing. You don't have to see what's going on around you. You can see what God wants you to see. You have two modes to your mouth. You have two modes to your eyes. You can keep your eyes on the ground and see what's going on in the world system and operate by it. Or you can lift up your eyes into the heavenlies and you can see the things that God has for you. And you can don't have to speak the jargon of the world. You can speak the talk of God. You can speak of victory. You can speak of overcoming. You can speak of the fact that you're the head and not the tail, that you're above and not beneath and that you have victory on every hand. I hope you're grasping what I'm trying to say to you. Um, look at here in Mark 11, 22 through 24. And Jesus answered and said unto them, have faith in God. For I verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say. Now he says, move out of your mealy mouth and move into the miracle mouth. You can say to the mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea and shall not doubt in thy heart what in your heart you can Stop seeing what is going on around you and start seeing what you'd like to have happen. Quit seeing yourself with a junk car. See yourself with a new car. Stop seeing yourself in a bad uh, area where you're living. Instead of trying to get the government to change it, go into the new government, the government of God, and have it changed by starting to see something better. Is anybody grasping what I'm saying? Uh, and, and then he said, um, but shalt believe that those things which thou sayest, they're your miracle mouth again. I can't get that enough of that said today. You have a miracle mouth and you have miracle eyes and how foolish it is to walk around with the dim view of your natural eyes and the dreary sound of your miracle vo of your uh, normal voice. Move your eyes into miracle mode. Start seeing yourself more than a conqueror. Start seeing yourself mighty to the pulling down of strongholds. Stop seeing yourself with insufficiency and start seeing yourself with exceeding abundantly above all you can ask or think. You will never plant seed at the level of things are in your life. You will never be able to plant the kind of seed that will get you out of trouble. It's when you can lift up your eyes and see yourself victorious. And you can see yourself accomplishing financial goals. All of a sudden you become more liberal. And the more liberal you become with God, the more liberal he becomes with you. I just feel like something good is about to happen. It's coming to this place. It's on its way. 
It's on the move right now. Is anybody learning anything? And think about it. The, uh, think about this as, as, as we move a little bit further. Abraham lifted up his eyes. You know, and I'm going to give you a, a secret here from Abraham. Abraham leaves Ur of the Chaldees, and he moves to the Holy Land, and really nothing big happens for Abraham. Nothing big happens for Abraham at all. He moves from one place to the other. But then in Genesis 13, 14, he begins something new. And the Lord said unto Abraham, after that lot was separated from him, you cannot fly with the eagles if you run with the turkeys. You're going to have to get some people out of your life. It was a hard thing for me to do, but I had some close friends that had to get out of my life because they were going someplace that I didn't want to end up. I wanted to go to another place. There was a season that nobody agreed with me except God, Jehovah, and his word. And from one glory to the next glory, God took me out of the pit that I had dug for myself as a young alcoholic, and he saw me into the good life and saw me with fine children and with a fine home and fine automobiles and with a giving to God to the point that exceeding abundantly above I can ask or think rolled back into my life through my harvest. Lift up your eyes, Abraham. You now have got rid of, of a lot. Remember, God said, don't take any relatives. And first thing in the morning, he loads Lot up into the wagon and drives out of Ur. And nothing happens to him for years. And all of a sudden, he now gets rid of Lot. And now God comes and says, all right, son, now we're ready to do business. Lift up your eyes. Now lift them up and look from the place where thou art, northward, southward, eastward, westward, uh, be circumspect, look at every direction, look at every possibility. And he says, for all the lands which thou seest, my goodness, child of God, look at the land around you. Look at the things that can be possessed. Look at all of the wonderful things that are out there, the business opportunities, the, 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 the great advantages for your children, all those things that lay just out there. If you can get your eyes off of what the government wants for your family, and come into what God's government wants for your family. I just know that something good is about to happen in your lives. And I will make of this, make that seed as the dust of the earth. I will make your seed as the dust of the earth. So that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shalt thy seed also be numbered. Wow. When Abraham's faith began to falter, then God provided dust by day and stars by night. Think about this thing, Genesis 15. And he brought him forth broad and said, look now towards heaven. You know, when he walked to, to the day, he kicked up dust everywhere that he went and he could see dust. But at night, at night, when he got all alone, child of God, let me tell you, there's a terror that comes by night. I tell you, you better not go to bed at night and not have some scalp somewhere that you took off of one of the enemies of God. I, I, I remember I had a car that were ready to repossess. And for many years after God gave me the finances to pay that car off and get it out of the hand of the creditors, I would take at night when the terror would come by night and the devil would come and say, you're never going to amount to nothing. You're going to lose everything you got. I'd open up that chest of drawers and I'd take out that pink slip and I said, devil, do you remember this? You remember this right here? You remember when I took the scalp off of this thing right here? When I hang it up in my tent? That's why, that's why David put the armor of, 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 of Goliath in his tent. I mean, every time he'd go out to battle, he'd get out there and he'd look and he'd see the guy that he's fighting and he might be six foot tall and he'd go in and he'd look at this giant that he slew that was eight foot tall. And he'll say, you don't have a chance, fella, because if I did it before, I'll do it again through my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Oh, hallelujah. Glory to God. Lift up your eyes into miracle mode. Get ready. Something good is about to happen to you. He said, when you see the dust, I like this about dust. In Job 22, 23 through 24, it says, if you return to the almighty God, you will be built up. You must put iniquity far from your dwelling place. Then shalt thou lay up gold as dust and the gold of offer as the stones of the brook. You know, one thing I know about Nigeria, one thing I know about Lagos is there's some dust here. 
You walk, <laughs> there's dust everywhere. And God says, look, I'm going to get you started down a new road. How are we going to do it, God? I don't have a thing. Well, I'm going to give you every day. They'll be like dust. You just get up, son. Get ready. I'll have more. It may not look like enough. It may not look like you got a whole bunch, but it, there'll be dust. There'll be new dust every time you need something. I'll have some new dust for you. And then as you grow and you go and all of a sudden you look down and you'll have gold like the stones of the brook. They'll be exceeding abundantly above all you can ask or think. Don't ever let another cloud of dust rise up off of a car wheel or off of a footstep or off of an animal's hoof that you don't see gold in, those, in that dust. And at night when the stars come out, don't look up there at the pretty lights, but see the fields white unto harvest as God is ready. Listen, you need a night vision too. You can't just get by with a day vision. Is anybody learning anything? Oh, man, the star fields are ready, ready for harvest. Uh, focus with me on one of, God's, uh, uh, one of God's victory strategies. When God led Israel into the battle with Jericho. Now, we're going to see this thing put in action that I'm preaching to you right now. In Joshua 6, 1 and 2. Now, Jericho was straightly shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out. And none came out. And the Lord said unto Joshua, See, I have given you into your hand Jericho and the king thereof, and the mighty men of valor. He said, Before a shot is fired, before you fire a shot, lift up your miracle eyes and start seeing Jericho fall before you. Start seeing the king laying dead on the ground. Start seeing all of the gold and the silver in that place turned over to the kingdom of God. Get your eyes right, and after you see him defeated, then move against him. Don't wait and see what the outcome is going to be. You set the outcome before it ever happens by lifting up your miracle eyes and seeing yourself victorious. Joshua, don't you make one step towards Jericho until you see them destroyed before your face. Oh, Brother John, that happens to be in one place in the Bible. It's all over the Bible. Joshua 8 and 1. And the Lord said unto Joshua, Fear not, neither be thou dismayed. Take all of the people of war with thee, and arise and go up to Ai. See, I have given unto thy hands the king of Ai, and the people and his, day, and, and, and his city and his lands. Don't move on the devil in any way till you see him under your feet. Don't move on any of these situations that come up ahead of you and see, let's see how it works out. Let's set how it works out before it starts working out by seeing it the way God wants it because you've got miracle eyes. You can see a thing and have it come to pass. You can say a thing and have it come to pass. You are a supernatural people with supernatural powers. You can operate in dimensions that the world only wishes they could dimension in, that could operate in. But thank God that it's in a book that we have possession of. And in that book, God tells us you don't have to be mediocre. You don't have to be average. You can be above average. You can be exceeding abundantly above all that's around you. But you got to start seeing it. And you got to start saying it. And you got to be believing it. Are you hearing this? God says meditate on your victories. Listen. Whatever that obstacle is that stands between you and the victory of God, whatever it is, please know it's very unstable. The Bible says, as powerful as the devil looks, as powerful as that obstacle in front of you looks, it's highly, highly unstable. It's completely unstable because it says over in 2 Corinthians 4, 18, while we look not on the things which are seen, don't look at things that you see, lift up your eyes. But at the things which are not, ah, now you're going, seeing something that's not. Seeing a new car where there's an old car sitting. Seeing a new house where there's an old house sitting. Seeing a position where you used to have a job. I never, people come to me and say, will you pray that I get a job? I said, I will not pray that you get a job. God has better for you than that. You need a position. You don't need no job. You need a position. Stop looking for jobs. Start looking for a position. Start looking for something that's got some benefits to it. Something that you'll be able to retire from and leave an inheritance to your children and your children's children. Your grandbabies have a right 
to have an inheritance. Let me tell you, at my funeral, they'll be crying. They'll be crying out at the funeral. But at the end, they'll be shouting and hollering and singing. Grandbabies will be running back and forth. They'll be saying, what did Pop Pop leave you? Hallelujah. Oh, are you hearing? Let your death be a celebration, not of only your life, but what you leave behind you for those that you love. Oh, I feel like something good is about to happen in this place. Are you getting ready for this? It's subject collapse. Whatever's standing in front of you, it's, it's on shaky ground because it's made out of the natural. It's made out of the natural. But the stuff that we have is made out of the supernatural. Grasp it. Get it inside of you. Don't let go of it. Uh, quickly, Psalms 25, 15, New Living says, My eyes are always on the Lord, for he rescues me from the traps of my enemies. Go ahead, Mr. Satan, set your traps. Go ahead, Mr. Fowler, put up the snare. But my God will show me where it is. I'll step around it. I'll step out of the problem and into magnificent victory. Are you grasping anything? Jacob demonstrated the power of the miracle mouth and miracle mode of the eyes. Listen, when you hear this, you're going to hear something you've never heard in your life. In Genesis 31.1, in the Good News Translation, Jacob heard that Laban's sons were saying, think about this. He hears that there's trouble. And Jacob had, take, that Jacob, Jacob had taken away everything that belonged to our father. He got all his wealth. Now, in Genesis 31, it says, and, uh, uh, and said unto them, Jacob, he says unto them, see your father. Listen to what he says. I've been watching. You better watch the people around you. You better not look at them with your own eyes. You better look at everybody with miracle eyes because before Laban ever turned on Jacob, Jacob was already seeing that there was something wrong in his heart. Your miracle eyes can tell you the people you can trust and the people that you can't. He says, see your father's countenance uh, that it's not towards me as before, but God of my father has, seen, has been with me. Are you learning anything? Learn how to read those that are around you. One of the things that will be powerful in your life when you can read when trouble is coming before it ever comes and prepare yourself for it because their eyes will give it away if you're in miracle mode. If you're in miracle mode. I hope you're getting what I'm saying. And your father has delivered me, uh, has, has deceived me, and changed my wages ten times. But God suffered not, me not to be hurt. Listen, what, you know what he says there? He says, okay, it looks like everything's been taken from me. But remember this, it ain't over till it's over. It ain't over till it's over. Don't count the score on my game right now because God is about to move. God is about to change some things and it's going to be such a surprise to the devil. But don't let it be a surprise to you. You need to know what's going on. Are you hearing? Listen to a bargain that he made. He makes a bargain with Laban. Jacob says, I don't want any wages anymore. No more wages. I will remove any and all the multicolored animals. And I'm just paraphrasing what we're going to read in a minute because it's a little difficult. It's written a little strangely. And he said, I, I, I removed all the multicolored animals and the lambs that, have been, uh, 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 that are mine. Uh, when all the lambs are born, they're gonna, this next year, they're all going to be mixed colors. He said, we're going to get rid of all the mixed colored lambs in the flock. And they're going off miles away to another place to graze. And we're going to have only the white, only all, all, every one of the lambs and goats will be white. But I'm telling you, everything that's born freckled and speckled and that has spots on it is going to be mine. And something takes place that all of a sudden, everything that's born out of those one colored uh, lambs and, and goats Every one of them comes forth with freckles and spots and, and, and black and, and brown. And it all comes from white parents and it, it genetically seems impossible. And then on top of that, now I'm going to read from the a message Bible. I don't usually use a message Bible a lot, but I, I read it now because it clarifies this. And this and, but this very day, Laban removed all the, mo the, the motted and spotted billy goats and all of the speckled and spotted nanny goats. Even, and even animals that had a touch of white on it, plus all the black sheep, and placed them under the care of his sons. 
Laban removes them way off. Three days journey, the 36th verse says. And uh, then he put a three-day journey between him and himself. Three days off is the closest place that a spotted lamb is or a spotted goat. But now this all white, white goats that he has, they're going to start bringing forth spotted and freckled lambs. And some of the most foolish things I've ever heard teachers say, they say at this point. But let's go a little further and you'll see what the problem is. And then it says in the 37th verse, here comes he, this what he's doing now is not to decide what color the lambs are going to be. It's to get Laban's mind off of what Jacob is doing. And Jacob took green rods. I'm in that 37th verse uh, 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 of poplar and almond and, pl and, and uh, of plain trees and uh, piled them in them in, in part. So when the black, when the bark was taken off in, in the parts that were piled, there appeared a uh, whiteness, but the parts which were whole remained green. By this means, the color was diverse. He, put, he puts all these different colors in front of him. And boy, have I heard some stories about why that worked. But you go through this thing and you, and you, and you keep reading and all of a sudden you're going to find out what happened. And um, let's see now. He, he peels the bark off of him and one thing and the other. That Now, here's what happens. And each new flock that was born came forth speckled and different colors from the white. But Genesis 31 explains to us what happened. Genesis 31 is going to tell you what happened. This wasn't some uh, hocus pocus. This wasn't some voodoo situation of looking at speckles and freckles. It says, and it came to pass when uh, at the time that the cattle conceived that I lifted up my eyes. I started seeing what I wanted those cattle to produce. I lifted up my eyes. I went into miracle mode. I can see Laban and his sons up on the mountaintop looking down, saying, you know, that, that guy's gone crazy. He's going into voodoo. He's putting sticks in front of him in different colors, and it's going to be a magic. He's going to do magic down there. He can't, he can't get us with magic, but that wasn't the case at all. He just lifted up his eyes and saw in a dream and behold the rams which leaped upon the cattle and ring shanked and speckled and grizzled and the angel of God spake unto me in a dream saying Jacob and I said uh, here am I and he said lift up now your eyes go into miracle mode son all the rams which leap upon the cattle and all the rim shanked speckled and grizzled for I have seen all that Laban doeth unto thee are you learning what I'm trying to say to you it doesn't matter if you have to come up with all white, have to, all white lambs have to come forth with all. And the only thing you're going to get is the speckled ones. Don't see it the way genetics says it will be. See it the way that God says it will be. See it the way you want it to be. See the result that you want from things long before it ever happens. Are you grasping anything of what I'm saying to you? Child of God, you've got miracle eyes. You've got a miracle mouth. You have a miracle working God. <clears throat> he does not function on that level that you see with your natural eyes. He functions on a supernatural level. And the world system does not have supernatural eyes. You're the one with the supernatural eyes. You're the one with the supernatural mouth. I don't know what the next thing is that the devil has planned for you. But you need to turn the tables on him. And whatever it looks like is getting ready to happen, move into miracle mode. Move into miracle mouth. Begin to speak your victory. Begin to see it the way you want it to be, not the way the devil wants it to be. Listen to me. Something good is about to happen. If you can just get your eyes in the right way, oh, hallelujah, our God is a miracle-working God. Are you ready for the victory? Here's what you need to do. Lift up your eyes and lift up your mouth. Glory to God. Somebody sing. Somebody do something. Am I on here? Let me, let me, get, let me use this mic. Give God a mighty shout in this place today. You heard the man of God. He's told us how to walk into our miracle blessing. 
I want our Love World Choir and our singers and musicians to get ready. And I want to pray a very special prayer over you there watching at your house because we're going to get ready to prepare a seed before the Lord right now because this is miracle moment where we're going to sow seed into good ground with Love World and wrap our faith around it and watch what God does. Somebody give God a shout in this place today. We believe, as Dr. Avanzini taught us, in miracle working moments where we lift up our eyes and we see. I love the reminder that he gave us about Dr. Oral Roberts. Something good is going to happen to you this very day. And you know when something good happens for us? When we obey a prompting of the Holy Spirit. When we look inwardly and we listen and we say, Holy Spirit, what is it that you're saying to me? I want to be obedient. I want to do exactly what you're prompting me to do. And in those moments when we respond, God his principles begin to unlock and they laugh. You see, Ephesians chapter 1 tells us he's already given us every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. He's already given us every spiritual blessing. So I'm not giving, hoping God will like me enough to give me something back. No, no, no. I'm accepting my responsibility to honor him by working a divine law. And he said if I would give to him, he would give back to me good measure pressed down shaken together and running over one day simon peter was was looking at jesus and he says lord i mean, i'd kind of like to know what's in this for us we we've left everything to follow you and jesus could have said really what, what exactly did you leave but he didn't but he looked him right back in the face and said nobody who leaves houses or lands father mothers or brothers for my sake or the gospels will fail to get it back in this lifetime 100 fold come on give god a shout today so Dr. Evansini, would you come and just stand here with me, and I'm going to pray a prayer. Matter of fact, I'd like all of our ministers to come and just stand around us here. We're going to get ready. You that are here live, we're going to, we're going to preach some more in just a moment. But I want us right now, for all of you that are watching at home, and I want to have our clock put up there so I can see the clock. But we're going to pray a prayer right now. I'm going to come into an agreement with these men of God and women of God. Sister Jessica's here. And I don't know when. You'll have another opportunity there at your house to plant a seed with this many people praying over it at one time as you are right now. When you think of the anointing and the grace, Dr. Avanzini, what a word you gave us. What a rich word. You just celebrated recently your 88th birthday. Am I correct in that? Come on. And this man of God has seen the seed work all over the world. And so I want to pray right now that I'm going to take hands with everyone here. And we're going to pray over your seed. I don't know whether you're watching on a business trip. Maybe you're there at your house. You were making a meal for your family. But right now, you know the Holy Spirit's hovering over these airwaves. And I'm asking the Holy Spirit right now to speak to 120 of us. I'm praying for 120 miracles in the lives of 120 people who the moment we finish this special prayer... The Love World musicians are going to continue playing for us and then they're going to go to a song. But I'm going to pray right now for 120 miracles in the lives of 120 people. And the moment I finish this special prayer, you're going to pick up the phone, dial the number that's on the screen, and you're going to plant this seed of $1,000. It may be something you'd set aside for a rainy day. It might be something you'd set aside for another purchase or something you were saving for a car. I was talking to Dr. Avanzini privately just before we came on the air today, and he was telling about a time he had saved money for a car, and the Holy Spirit directed him unannounced on a, on a spot of the moment to plant, what'd you save? He'd save 21000 at that $21, point? $21,000 he'd saved to buy a car, and the Holy Spirit said, plant that seed, and God has blessed your life 10 times, 100 times, 1,000 times more. And by the way, that car that I passed up and bought, uh, put the money in God's kingdom, that car's in a junkyard somewhere. And in my garage sits a new $200,000 car. It's not going to cost you a cent to give to God. It's going to cost the devil if you do. Hey, yes, come on, somebody. So this is our moment. We're going to pray for you. God may stir you to sow a seed at a different amount. If he does, you obey. I have felt all week as I was preparing to be here at Love World that there's many who are going to plant a seed of $100,000. And I felt stir to the Lord that the moment I begin to name financial figures, 
You who are supposed to sow at that amount will instantly have an inner knowing. It'll be an instant confirmation. There's people this week that'll be sowing million dollar seed. There's people this week that are sowing hundred thousand dollar seed. I felt so stirred a few hours ago about a man who'll be planting a ten thousand dollar seed every month for the next 12 months out of his business, out of his ministry. You may feel stirred to be a part of that, but we're not going to let these moments pass with our hands closed. We're going to plant a seed today, and we're going to start with this $1,000 seed. I like to tell people to just count 90 days from the day you sow it and watch what God begins to do. Journal it. We're going to wrap our faith around it, and when I pray for people's money, Things happen. Good things happen. I know these men and women of God, when we pray over your seed, something powerful is going to happen. And when God sees it, something incredible is going to happen. Open up your miracle ears. Come on. Open up your miracle yes. ears and hear God speaking to you right now. That's not the voice of a man you just heard. It's the voice of God. Lift up your miracle ears and find your way into the dreams that you have. Yes, oh, praise God. God. Father, in the name of Jesus, yes. we that are here live in this audience, we stretch our hand out toward the pulpit of God, which represents the Word of God. Father, I come into a covenant right now for 120 miracles in the lives of 120 people who will immediately go to the phone or go online and plant this seed of $1,000. Lord, many are going to pull it from one account and move it into another. Some are going to take money they'd set aside for a different purchase. But now they're feeling redirected to make this a miracle seed. And I come into a covenant with them that the next 90 days will unlock the greatest season of harvest they've ever had in their life. I join my hands with those on this platform and we release the harvest back to every obedient seed sower on the $1,000 seed, the $10,000 seed, $100,000 seed, and the million dollar seed from all around the world. We thrust this seed into love world, wrapped in our faith, and we call in our harvest in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And all of God's people say, it is done in the name of the Lord. The Love World singers are getting ready to go with the, to the Lord in a song. I want you to pick up your phone right now. Dial the number that's on the screen right now. The preaching and teaching is over for this moment. Now is our time to respond. Pick up the phone right now. Dial the number that's on the screen. You can sow conveniently and securely through the online methods as well. All of the information is there on the screen. You that are here live with me in the audience, we'll have an opportunity to plant our seeds in just a moment. But I'm talking right now to our Love World family all around the world. The phone lines I know are already jamming up, so quickly go to the phone right now. Dial the number that's on the screen. Don't let these moments close with your hands closed because as Bishop James Payne has taught us, the only seed that's unproductive is the one that you never sow. The seed is so powerful. Even a seed of nothing creates a harvest of nothing. So right now we're going to sow the seed, wrap our faith around it, and bring in the good measure pressed down, shaken together, and running over. As you go to the phone, our Love World singers are going to begin to sing right now. Let's listen to this song. Go to the phone right now, and we'll be back in just a few moments. Jesus 
God, praise God, praise God. Oh, we sing of His grace. We sing of our precious Lord Jesus Christ. So many of you are going to the phone. The phones have been jammed. Keep calling if you haven't gotten through. If you called and got a busy signal, 
Even your calling back is a seed of your patience and your perseverance. God will honor. So wait 30 seconds and call again. If you're wanting to sow through the convenience of the online information, it's all there on the bottom of the screen. We want to welcome you to Praise the Thought. We're here live in Lagos, Nigeria with God's favorite people. If you believe that, give God a shout today. I'm here in the beautiful, beautiful auditorium. We're so thankful for our dear man of God, Pastor Chris, who's brought our team here today. Pastor Benny Hinn is with us this week. We're so excited about that. Yes. We have our beautiful and amazing Love World singers and musicians, and they're scattered all across this great auditorium today. Pastor Dan Willis, Bishop James Payne, Bishop Clarence McClendon. I'm Dr. Mike Smalley. I'm honored to be here. Back behind me, we have our general, our dear man of God, Dr. John Avanzini, who's with us. Pastor Jason Avanzini, his beautiful wife, Jessica. And behind me here are my brothers from another mother, my beautiful friends. We have Reverend Ray with us, Evangelist Eddie. Let's give God some praise today for these gifts and these many women of God. We have you, our Love World family. Today's going to be a very, very bad day for the devil. And as the Love World musicians keep playing just for a moment, I want to welcome you to this program. And I want to pray over you. I want you just to stop what you're doing right now there at your house. You may be watching on a traditional television set. Maybe you're watching on your handheld device in an airport. There's a lot of noise around you. Or maybe you're somewhere in a hospital waiting for someone you love to have surgery. You're, you're watching through your computer, your laptop. You're watching on the Love World app. I don't know how the Holy Spirit's made it possible for you to hear the sound of my voice right now, but I want you to focus in on me and on you, just you and I. See, Jesus said, if just two people, everybody in the building here just shout with me, say two. Oh, you can do better than that. One, two, three, how many? You can, I, I know, I'm in Nigeria. Come on, this is not Texas. I, I know you guys know how to shout. We're going to say the number two. Jesus said, if how many? That's more like it. If two locked into a covenant agreement, Jesus said if two agreed about anything touching on the earth, it would be done for them by our Father which is in heaven. So listen to me. You don't need a hundred people praying for you to get a miracle. You don't need a thousand people praying for you to have a breakthrough. Thank God for a lot of people that'll pray. But Jesus said to get a touch and an answer, you needed two, and I'm your one. You're my one, so together you and I make two. Jesus said, If two or three are gathered in my name, he's where? He's here. And as before he died on the cross, now that he's gone to heaven, the Holy Spirit lives in all of us, so he never leaves us, he never forsakes us. So we bring him everywhere we go. So I want to lock into a prayer covenant with you today. This is Praise a Thon, where we focus on the Great Commission, getting the gospel out to the ends of the earth, and we focus on obeying. The command to present seed to God, wrapping our faith around it and calling back in our harvest. So this is a week for you. This is your week to get breakthrough. This is your week to have a harvest. This is your week to schedule something that's been promised to you that you haven't yet possessed. Are you hearing me today? Something in your hand, your seed, can create anything you've been promised. Something in your hand can create anything you've been promised if you'll use your faith and your obedience and plant your seed. So this is a week for you. This is a week Pastor Chris has felt led of the Holy Spirit to bring the team across from the states and join our anointing here with the amazing team here in Lagos. And what a team is here. What a team. The Love World team, the Christ Embassy team, the Rhapsody of Realities team, the best of the best. Come on, right here. Going all around the world in Lagos, Nigeria. Pastor Chris, thank you for the honor of being here. We're very much a part of what you're doing because we're like Aaron and her holding up the hands of Moses and we're here to hold up your hands. And we're here to help you get this gospel out to the ends of the earth and honor our King of Kings and our Lord of Lords and give the gospel of Jesus Christ to every man, woman, boy, and girl. Isn't it amazing, by the way? Come on, family, you're right here in Nigeria. So do you know how many countries, how many Christians all around the world wish they could live right here where you do so you could physically be around our man of God and all that God has done. Do you know how blessed you are? Oh, what a privilege for you. Yes. So many of you, like me, you don't live in Lagos or you don't live in Nigeria, but you, you tune in all the time on your partners and your daily readers of the Rhapsody of Realities. And we have a great responsibility. You know, Leonard Ravenhill was, a, was the first major mentor of mine that was a preacher. And he said to me right before he died, speaking of the Great Commission, he said, Mike, 
He said, your generation, you that are younger, you that will, will be alive long after I'm dead, he said, you have the greatest responsibility before you ever. But he said, it's the greatest privilege. And he said, I think the Apostle Paul would trade places with you any day if he could have been a part of the end time army that was bringing in the last day harvest of the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is why we're here. This is why our man of God has led us to set aside this time so we can focus on the eternity. Focus on lost men and women, boys and girls who need the gospel and sow our seeds so the principles of God can be at play in our life. We can get our harvest and be a blessing to our family. Our church and the work of God. How many of you think the devil is going to have a bad, bad day in this place and all around the world because we're going to obey the Lord? So I want to pray a very special prayer over your life right now. And whatever distraction may be in your physical room, tell everybody around you just to leave you alone for a few minutes and focus on what God's put in my heart just for you. See, everything I'm about to preach, I already know. Or I would not be able to preach it to you. So I'm not here to talk to me. God put in my mouth what he wanted you to hear. Because he knew what I didn't know. He knew every single person who'd be listening to the sound of my voice today. He knew whether you'd be watching live, watching on a replay, watching today, watching a month from now. He knew and he wanted you to hear this message because he wants his word to have its place in your heart and to change you and take you to a whole new level. How many remember the John when he wrote the book of the Revelation? He's in John chapter 1, this is Revelation chapter 1. This is a man who lived with Jesus physically for three years. Reverend Ray knew what he looked like, Evangelist Eddie, he knew what he sounded like, he had meals with him, he fished, he did all that stuff with him. But in Revelation chapter 1, he's on the Isle of Patmos, Love World Singers, and boy, don't you guys look gorgeous tonight. And I see everybody all the way over here, all our musicians, you're carriers of the anointing of God, and we honor you today. And John's on the Isle of Patmos, Revelation chapter 1, he's been around Jesus for a long time, but Jesus appears in a way... John had never seen him before. He said his head and hair were white like wool. His voice was like the sound of many rushing waters, feet like bronze. And he fell at his feet, the Bible says, as if he were a dead man. Why? Because he was seeing a side of Jesus he had never seen before. He'd been around Jesus a lot. He'd even been writing parts of your Bible. First John, second John, third John. The gospel according to John. But he had not seen Jesus quite like this. There was still something more he did not yet know. And how many of you know today, as long as you've walked with Jesus, there's still something you don't yet know that he wants to show to you. So the Bible says he turned, this is a tricky thought, he turned to see a voice. How do you see a voice? You can hear a voice, but you don't see a voice. But the Bible says he turned to see a voice. And Jesus, he said, he saw seven golden lampstands there. And Jesus said to him, look at them. Seven lampstands represent the seven churches. And he talked about some things. And then he said, now, John, you may be old. You may be on this prison island, but you got one more assignment left. Write the things which you will see and hear that I'm about to show you. And in his 90s, he got a new vision of Jesus. He got a new vision of his bride. And he got a new vision of his role in the Great Commission. How many of you like one more time this week for God to show you a new vision of Jesus, a new vision of your life assignment, and a new picture of the bride of Christ? Come on, give God a shout today if this is your heart. That's why we're here, to focus on him. So I'm real serious about this. So I'm going to stretch my hand out to you. You that are here in the building with me, stretch your hand out toward me, toward the pulpit of God, which represents the Word of God. You that are watching there at your home, you're on the business, on a plane, wherever you are, God brought you to this moment. You're watching on the app, you're watching on replays, you're watching on King's Chat. This is for you. God wants to take you to a new level. You're going to receive information, impartation. You're going to receive an instruction. We're going to obey the promptings of the Holy Ghost and make this a bad, bad, horrible, miserable night for the devil. In Jesus' name. Father, we come before your throne, this matchless name. You told us to come in, the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. We give you all the praise and the glory and the honor. We thank you, first of all, for our salvation. We thank you that Romans chapter 10, verse 9 says, If I confess with my mouth, Jesus Christ is Lord. And I believe in my heart that he died and rose from the dead, that I would be born again, I'd be saved. So, Father, right now for those watching who've just been channel surfing and just stumbled upon this preacher and they have no idea what a praise-a-thon is, they have no idea what love world is, they've never heard of it before. They're aching in their heart and they know they can't have another year like the one they've just had. They know they can't have another day like the one they just had. And they know there's a fast beat of their heart taking place right now and they know it's no coincidence they're hearing somebody say, 
You can be born again. You can be saved. Believing's never enough. The devil believes in Jesus. The devil believes in the Bible. Demons believe in churches. Believing's never enough. You've got to say it. You've got to say it with your mouth. But I'm here to look you right in the camera and say it doesn't matter who you slept with, what you smoked, what you snorted, what you shot in your veins. It doesn't matter what you've said, what you've done. It doesn't matter if you've been abused or you're the abuser. Jesus said, whoever comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. There's a seat for you at the table of the Lord. All you have to do is receive the gift of righteousness. So before I preach, I just feel so stirred. Right where you are, you can say it. We're all going to say it here together right now just to agitate the devil. We're going to confess with our mouth, Jesus is Lord. We're going to confess this. We believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead. And then I'm going to finish my prayer. We're going to teach and preach. And this is going to be a phenomenal day for us. Would you say it with me? You right there at your house. If you're not right with God, you don't, there's not a peace in you. You don't know that you're right with Jesus. The Bible says his spirit will bear witness with your spirit. God will tell you and you'll have an inner knowing. And no man can ever shake it out of you. Let's say it together right now. Like I'm a preacher getting you married to Jesus. Say your vows on me right now. Come on, everybody. Say it with boldness and passion. Lord Jesus, I come to you now. I need you. I've sinned. I need a Savior. So as an act of my will, I confess with my mouth, Jesus Christ is my Lord, my Savior, my very best friend. I believe he died on the cross in my place for my sins, rose from the dead, and is alive today. And I receive right now the gift of everlasting life in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Oh, say it with passion. Thank you, Lord, for hearing my prayer in Jesus' name. Now, Father, we know you heard every prayer. So as you bear witness with our spirit that we pass from death unto life, I come into covenant for the rest of this evening. That you deposit your word in our spirit. Show every one of us what's next for our life. Take us to a whole new level in you. And we'll give you all the praise and the glory and the honor in Jesus' matchless name. And if you believe it and you love him, give him one more shout of praise as you're seated today. Come on. Oh, you can shout better than that. Come on. Thank you, Love World Singers. Praise the name of the Lord. You may be seated today. You there at your house, get a pen, get a piece of paper. The next few minutes, I want to talk to you about something so vitally important for your life. I want to tell you a true story that that impacted me as a young man. I grew up in a church where Kenneth Hagin preached a lot. His uh, son and my mother used to go out after church, and they they went on youth group dates and things like that. And His his daughter spent the night in our home when I was a boy. His son-in-law prayed in a car in 1963 with my father to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And my father began to speak in tongues in the front seat of, of, of his car. And so we have deep roots going back in my childhood life with Brother Hagin. And years ago, I was at a funeral for a, a precious lady that he had known. And I saw Brother Hagin, Kenneth Hagin, standing in the corner. So I thought, this is a chance for me to go and talk to this man of God. I, he's by himself. I'm going to take advantage of this. So I walked over and began to talk to him. And, and I was just starting out at that time as an evangelist. And so it's been a few years. This July will be my 42nd anniversary in the ministry. So I've been doing this a few weekends now. I started when I was 14. I just turned 56. So I had Brother Hagen in the corner. I said, Brother Hagen, I'm just starting out. And I wanted to know, what would you say to a young man like me that's starting out? And I just sat back and waited for him to give me a piece of advice that I just knew was going to be profound. I knew I was going to have to write it down. He was going to give me some kind of a wisdom key that was going to be something I'd never thought of before. You know, that kind of thing. That's what I was wanting him to, you know, solve a bunch of problems with one little sentence or something. And he turned to me, and I'll never forget it. He actually hit me in the stomach. <laughs> Brother Hagen hit me in the stomach. And he just turned. We were right close to each other like I am to you right now, Reverend Ray. I'm not going to hit you, but thank you for at least standing. So I, I, just, I just walked over Brother Hagen. I'd like to ask this question. And he just backhanded me like that, bam, right in the stomach. And he said, here's the word for you, son. And he just went like this. He goes, don't quit. And that was it. He just looked down at the floor. And I thought to myself, I just got punched by Kenneth Hagen in the stomach. And all he said was, don't quit. Now, I didn't want to be disrespectful, but I wanted to say, Brother Hagen, thank you for hitting me, and thank you for giving me these words, but I already knew that. I already knew not to quit. I want you to tell me something really deep and really profound. 
And at that point, his son, Kenneth Hagin Jr., saw us were talking. So he came over with a smile on his face, which told me I probably wasn't the first young guy he'd punched in the stomach. And he came over to watch, you know, for more. And he walked over and he said, what did dad just tell you? I said, he just hit me in the stomach and told me not to quit. And at that, Brother Hagin began to laugh. And he said, son, you don't get it, do you? That really is the key to everything. He said, I'm in my 80s, my 70s, whatever it was at the time. And he said, every day I get up, go to the office, I preach the gospel, I write books, I go to bed, I get up. I do the will of God all day long. Then I go to bed. Then I get up and do the will of God again. He said, that's the whole key. He said, it really is just that simple. Every day, no matter what you're going through, you don't stop. You don't quit. You don't quit sowing. You don't quit believing. You don't quit decreeing. You don't quit praying in the Holy Ghost. You don't quit loving. You don't quit forgiving. He said, the key to everything is two words. Don't quit. And then he just turned and walked off. And here I am in Lagos, Nigeria, and on worldwide television sharing that with you. No matter what you've gone through, no matter what you've faced, the answer is still the same. Don't quit. The answer is don't stop. The answer is not turning your back. The answer is standing in the face of the enemy and saying, here I am. Keep watching me. Look at your neighbor and smile real big and say, one day it'll pay you to know me. So be nice to me. One day it'll pay you to know me. Look at somebody there at your house and say, come and shake my hand because everything I touch is blessed. I just dare you to do it right now. Look at somebody and say, everything I touch is blessed. I'd shake my hand if I were you. And when I was a boy and I would hear Brother Hagin come and they would share testimonies, I want to share one with you quickly and then I want to pray over your life. And there is an anointing on my life. I heard Oral Roberts say years ago, he said, if I didn't pray for the sick, I would answer to God for it because there's an anointing and a grace on me to bring healing to people. And I, I feel that way when I preach about seed and when I preach about money and finance. That so many things happen when I pray for people that if I didn't talk about this, if I didn't pray, I would have to answer to the Lord for it. So I flew all the way from Texas to tell you, don't quit. God's got a harvest for you. And we're going to talk a few minutes today about how you can have more of them. Somebody shout amen. I remember the story they were telling about a pastor in North Korea or Korea at the time in the 1950s when the communists began to take over and they began to make churches illegal and preaching illegal. There was a man of God still meeting privately with his church. They were just not announcing it publicly. And it was winter time and Korea gets really bad winters. And it had snowed and there was ice everywhere and they were at the base of a mountain. It's a true story. And the police began to find out about this particular meeting. In the middle of the pastor's message, they kicked in the door of the church and they began grabbing people and arresting people and they were scrambling and running around and doing everything they could to get away. And the pastor had to run out the back door, but he was unable to grab his coat or his hat or his gloves. He ran straight under the cold and began to run straight up the mountain running for his life. They were going to arrest the congregations, but they were going to kill the preacher because he was the head guy. So if they killed him, then they, everybody else they think just dispersed. So he runs straight up Reverend Ray into the mountains. And Dr. Avanzini, it's way below zero. It's really cold and he has no jacket. And he's looking down, he stops running after a while, it's dark, he looks down, he sees the trucks are pulling up, they're arresting all of the people, taking his congregation to jail. He doesn't know when he'll ever see him again. And he knows he's on paper, he's a dead man. It's too cold for him to stay alive all night. He'll freeze to death. He has no way of getting a coat. He can't go to the store. He can't go down the mountain. They'll, they'll, they're waiting for him there. He can't go home. They'll arrest his family. So he had nothing to do but to lay down in the snow and pray. And he just said, Lord, I, I can't do anything but this. So I'm going to have to go to sleep. And I know my body will die in the night in the natural because I'm going to it's, it's below freezing. It was, it was in a, we had, your metric system here was to be like negative 30 degrees, okay, way below zero. The wind is blowing. He's in the snow. He knows his body temperature is going to plummet during the sleep, and he's going to die before he wakes up. So he just says this, Lord, if you want me to come home tonight, I'll see you in the morning. I'm going to lay down and go to sleep. And if I freeze to death in my sleep, you'll be the first person I see when I wake up, and that'll be okay with me. 
If you want me to keep working for you, if you have a plan for my life beyond tonight, somehow, some way, keep me through this storm, and I'll wake up in the morning, and I'll know it's your will for me to serve you from here on out, and that's what I'm going to do. So either way, I win. That was his philosophy. So he laid down, and he went to sleep. And to his joy, he woke up the next morning. That was a happy morning. He woke up. First thing he realized, I'm not dead. So that was a good way to start his day. And he opened his eyes, but he couldn't see anything. It was dark. But he he was moving around a little bit, and he noticed something really heavy was on top of him. At first he thought it had snowed, you know, snowed over him during the night. But he started trying to open his eyes and rub his eyes, and he wasn't seeing snow. He was seeing black and orange and some weird colors. And he thought, man, I'm hallucinating because I'm, I'm freezing to death. And then he realized that what was on top of him was really heavy, and it was breathing. And that was when he moved a little bit more, and the tiger that was laying on top of him stood up. Turned around, looked the man of God in the face, licked him on the cheek, and ran off into the woods and never harmed the man of God. He realized God sent the tiger during the night to cover him with his body heat and the tiger was the answer to his prayer. So sometimes what you think has come to take you out, God has used to set you up for your next promotion. That boss that won't give you a raise, that relative that always talked down to you, that negative self-image your uncle tried to attach to you, that might have been what you thought was your last night. But God was using it as a springboard to send you into your season of next and your divine provision. Give him a shout of praise if you believe it today. Samson's walking down the road got his mom and dad with him he's hot he's dehydrated the bible says he he has a lion come out to kill him he's still he's still got strength so he kills that lion with his bare hands and chunks his dead body in the bushes and goes on about his way bible says some weeks and months later he's coming back down the same sidewalk and his mom and dad are with him i believe the scripture says in judges and they're hungry they got no food they've got no water they're thirsty they're dehydrated they're in trouble physically and they walk upon the now half decomposed carcass of the lion and he says oh what's this the lion I killed and in the meantime in the rib cage a bee swarm had come in and built a hive and had been long enough that they'd made honey and the Bible says this is key he reached into the lion's carcass and pulled out that honey and sustained him so the point is sometimes what you think's come to kill you God is setting up to be your buffet table down the road and what seems like something bitter you'll reach in and pull out something sweet if you don't quit and so we come with all of these type of encouraging stories to Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3 and they'll put that up on the screen for you there watching at your house Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3 is probably one of my very favorite scriptures in the Bible and it tells us that God has already everybody say already Already. you there at your house I know I can't hear you physically but say it with me Already? already he's already blessed us it's past tense with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in Christ. So you've already been given a yes answer by God. He's already said yes to every single blessing there is in the heavenly places. How many of you think that's a good thing? How many of you think some of God's blessings include prosperity, divine provision, being able to be good to your kids, being able to be good to your elderly parents, being able to fund the Great Commission, start a business, pay cash for a car. We've got a Jehovah Jireh in our life because Jehovah Jireh is not a person that we praise. It's a place that we live. I live in the place of Jehovah Jireh. So Ephesians 1 verse 3 says, He's already given us. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has. Everybody say has. He has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in Christ. So you've already been given great blessings. I hear people when it comes to money all the time. And money in the church, divine provision, divine prosperity, talking about it to some Christians is like that tiger. 
Something big and nasty and mean, and they don't want to talk about it. They don't want anything to do with it. Something really, just, no, this is not for me. That's for somebody else. That, that, that lion coming to get Samson didn't look like anything linked to prosperity, but that was being set up to save his life one day. And how many of you think every day you get your life saved is a pretty good harvest? He drew something sweet out of what had tried to kill him. Some of you have been this close to some real great financial blessings, but you let a little unforgiveness get in, a little bitterness got in, a little complaining got in, a little mumbling and grumbling crept in, and God wasn't quite able to pop you up to that new level. It wasn't because the lion hadn't been slain. It wasn't because the beehive wasn't there and the honey wasn't there. It was because you got so upset about the attack, you forgot to see the buffet table he provided for you in the presence of your enemies. So God wants us to learn about provision. He wants us to learn about prosperity. He wants us to know. And so he's given us divine laws. Everybody say divine laws. Divine laws. You see, that you watching here at your house, God has put divine providence in place and divine principles, and he sets before us life and death, blessing and cursing, and then says, I'll let you guys choose. He lets us make the decision. Jesus, for instance, saved us. He provided for us a means to be born again and then told us that this same salvation would be available for everybody, but then he made us responsible for going to tell them all about it. So he did his part in saving us. Now our part is telling everybody about it. When Jesus died, he took on your sin so you don't have to have the penalty of sin. He took on your disease so you wouldn't have to be sick. And he took on your poverty so you wouldn't have to be broke. How many of you think all of that is good news? It's the gospel. It's the good news. I don't have to be broke. I don't have to be sick. But just because, you have to think of it this way. If your father put a million dollars in your bank account, but you never went to the bank to make the withdrawal, You'd be rich on paper, but broke at your house. If, you're, if, if a billionaire walked up to you, Elon Musk walked up to you and said, I'm going to give you a billion dollars, a billion with a B. It's in your account. I just direct deposited it. But if you didn't go pull that money out, it wouldn't help you at all. You couldn't buy a loaf of bread with it. You couldn't do anything with it. If you didn't go in, tell them who you were at the bank, show your ID, and cash out what you've been given, you would stay just as broke as if he'd never put it in the bank. Well, there are Christians who don't understand that when Jesus died, he died so you could be born again. He died so you could be healthy, and he died so you could be wealthy. He's already said yes to every spiritual blessing, but he hands you and I a checkbook called the commandments and the laws and the promises, and you and I are responsible for cashing the check and bringing the blessing on home. We do that through obedience to divine laws. See, I don't give an offering to God hoping he'll like what I did enough to give me an offering back. I operate in a divine principle that he's made me responsible for. He said, if you'll give first, I'll give back good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. He told me if I would ask, he would answer. He told me if I would seek, I would find. He told me if I would knock, he'd open a door. But ask, seek, and knock is my responsibility. Open, find, and answer is his. And there are Christians all over the world Throwing up a need to God. I got a need. Got a this. Got a this. Got my school fees. I've got, I've got rent. I've got overhead. I've got, I've got stuff. I've got, I got medicine I can't buy. I've got all these things. Lord, come on. I, I, I need you to bless me. Help me out. They don't understand. He's already blessed us. He's already said yes. But he's given us keys and principles that unlock what he's already done in the spirit realm and bring it into the natural realm. Somebody shout Hallelujah. So this is why we give. We give, of course, because we love him. We give because he first loved us. We give because we believe in the Great Commission. But the principles of sowing, waiting, and reaping, seed, time, and harvest, he's given us the responsibility of starting it and promised us he would always finish it. And our reaction to that showcases our faith. Somebody said to me one time, Mike, I sowed a seed once, and I haven't got a harvest from it yet. What, what, what does that mean? And the answer is very simple. Waiting is the proof of trust. If I told my son, I'll meet you at the bus stop at 12 noon. If 5 after 12 comes and I'm not there, he'll know something's happened, but I'm coming anyway. may take a few minutes. Something may have happened. I may have had a flat tire along the way. But he waits for me because he trusts me. 
because I've never told him I'd be somewhere that never showed up at all. Waiting is the proof of trust. When you sow a seed and your harvest hasn't come back as fast as you think, you don't stop sowing, you keep sowing more. And waiting is the proof you believe what he told you. See, when Jesus was walking on the water, read the context. He told the disciples, I want some time by myself. You guys get in a boat, and what did he say? Watch this. Go to the other side. I'll meet you on the other side. In the meantime, a storm came up and freaked them out. And the Bible says they thought they were going to die, which tells you they forgot what he said. I'm going to meet you on the other side. If they would have remembered he's going to meet us on the other side, then the storm would mean nothing to them. They're going to meet him on the other side. But they gave him to cry out. He had mercy on them, so he just walked out to them. They still thought it was a ghost. I'm sure he's shaking his head. Guys, what else do I have to do? I told you something would happen. All I needed you to do was row to the other side, and you would have found me there. What does a storm have to do? You see, so many people bail out in the middle of all that, but I'm here to tell you what Dr. Avanzini said and what Dr. Oral Roberts said. Something good is getting ready to happen to you. You just can't quit. You just can't quit. So Genesis 8.22 told us his principle, that as long as the earth remains, There'll be summer and winter, cold and heat, seed, time, and harvest. Say those three things with me right now, would you? Seed, time, and harvest. One more time with passion. Ready? Seed. There's no such thing as sowing and reaping. It's sowing, waiting, reaping. Seed, time, harvest. And the time part is the real drag. Because nobody likes to wait. We want things to happen faster than sometimes they do. But our faith and our expectation is the magnet that draws in the harvest. So I want to give you two or three things to write down about divine provision, the law of the seed. Based on what we've just read in Ephesians chapter 1. That he's already said yes. So there's no income cap on anybody. God never looked at a man and said this is all you can make and no more. God never looked at a woman and said that's enough, no more. I love motorcycles. I, I, that's what I, some people play golf. I've never got into golf. Golf doesn't make a lot of sense to me. It's, you take a stick into a piece of grass. You drop a ball, and you hate that ball so much. You try to hit that ball as far away from you as you can, and then you run to find it. And when you find it, you get so excited you hit it as far away from you can again and you run to find it some more. And that's supposed to be fun. I don't enjoy that, so I ride motorcycles. When I want to have a nice day off, I get on my Indian Roadmaster and I ride out into the country and I pray and talk in tongues and look at mountains and streams and stuff like that. My mother doesn't approve of that, but I just said, Mama, God's got me. She said, people die on motorcycles. I said, they die in cars too, but I'm not walking. So I, I looked for two years for my dream motorcycle. And in 2016, I bought it. And I said something about it in a church service. God just blessed me. I bought my dream motorcycle. And some lady, imagine, stands up and says, think of all the children you could have fed if you hadn't have bought that motorcycle. I said, oh, one of these kind again. I said, ma'am, how many shoes do you own? She said, I got 10 pair. I said, hypocrite, you can only wear one at a time. Why you got more than that? I, I'm very clear. How many bathrooms in your house? You can't use more than one at a time. I, she didn't want to talk anymore after that. So it never dawned on her, the same God that could bless me with a motorcycle could bless everybody else with 10,000 other things and never be depleted one second of his life because he owns everything. So when you think about divine prosperity and divine provision, let me give you some keys to prosper. Number one is your mindset. You're poor in your mind before you're poor in your wallet. You get poor in your mind. There's a poverty mentality in people. And I've been to 42 countries, I think, 43. We planted 50 churches in Ghana, been all over Africa. Africa's been my favorite place to preach since I started preaching. I just... Fell in love with Africa, Liberia, Rwanda, Ghana, Kenya, Nigeria, of course, is my favorite country in Africa. But I see the same everywhere. 
I can go to a church in Beverly Hills, California and meet Christians who have a poverty mindset. Get mad when somebody's blessed. Think that it's selfish to believe for God's harvest when God told you to expect one. Poverty is a mindset before it's a financial figure in your bank account. I need you to hear me today. God doesn't need Christians to stay broke. We can't finance the Great Commission broke. It just makes so much sense to me. If you've got $1,000 to feed hungry children, wouldn't it be better if you had $10,000? Couldn't you feed more with $100,000? It, it, it just make, why, why, why did money ever get to be a bad thing? I've had people tell me, I, I don't like going to church because they talk about money. Really? Did you stop going to the stores, to the malls? Did you stop playing golf? Did you stop driving a car? Did you stop buying? Because everywhere you go, they ask for money. I said to a man one day, what's it like living at your house with no, with no electricity? He said, well, I got electricity. I said, how? You told me you don't go around any place that asks for money. I said, every 30 days, the electric company sends you a thing called a bill. They don't say you happy birthday, happy anniversary. Your wife looks nice, nice dress, nice tie. The only time you hear from them is when they're asking for money, but you hadn't cut the power off yet. How come? I said, a, a $5 bill blows across the parking lot. You break your back trying to bend over and catch it and put your hand in muddy water. Look what I got. Then you go to church. People work 40 and 50 hours a week and then go to church. And what are they doing? They're working 40 hours a week pursuing money. Then they go to church. And if a man of God spends more than 90 seconds telling them how they can get more of it, they get mad. Which tells you all the world's crazy people have not been yet locked up. They're all around us. I mean, they're, they're everywhere. Don't look at them right now. Just know. God has not said any of us, here's your income. This is it. Just right here. Somebody asked me one time, are you a prosperity preacher? I said, what does that even mean? If I say no, does that make me a poverty preacher? If I'm somewhere in between, am I a middle class preacher? I just preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. That, that, that's all I do. And he said, not me, he said, if I would give something to a God I cannot see, he would get in covenant with it and send it back to me. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over. He said, if I would honor him with my first fruits, my barns, plural, would be filled with plenty. He said, if I bring in the tithe, he'd open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing. I don't have room enough to receive. And then he said this, I will rebuke the devourer for your sake, which means when you tithe, he'll bless you with stuff you don't have and protect the stuff you do have and it'll last longer and God becomes an enemy to your enemies. I've got a car at home. I could have bought another one. I could have bought five cash long ago. But this particular car is 10 years old. And I, I drive it because it's like a testimony to me. It has over 300,000 miles on it. And it's never been in the shop one hour ever for anything. It's like my supernatural reminder that my tithing keeps working for me. God will touch your life. You have to be a fool not to believe in giving and sowing and reaping. Buddhists believe in it. Hindus believe in it. All the world's religions believe you get what you sow. You reap what you sow. What comes around goes around. It's just the law of the seed. Seed, time, harvest. Waiting is the proof of trust. Believing in that doesn't make you prosper. Activating the law gets God involved. Number one is your mindset. Number two is you have to recognize that your number one seed is your mouth. The first seed you sow is your mouth. You get your words in line with God. Stop talking poor, stop talking broke. Stop saying religious things. Because as Dr. Avanzini's taught us, religion is the only thing on earth that can package and sell people poverty and they get excited about it. Donald Trump with all of his money, if he spent $1 million a day, he couldn't get people to be excited about being broke. But preachers do it every Sunday. And they think, oh, well, we're, we're broken, we're humble. No, you're ignorant and ineffective. <laughs> People are singing about heaven, streets of gold, gates of pearl. Did you know the largest pearl ever found on the earth is not even as big as the size of a man's fist? And the Bible says that the gates in heaven are made of pearl. 
And the Bible says heaven is 1,500 miles tall, 1,500 miles wide, 1,500 miles deep. That's some pretty big hinges, and the gates are made of pearl. The biggest one found on the earth is not even as big as my fist, but the ones in heaven are 1,500 miles, and there's more than one of them. It doesn't sound like a ghetto or a trailer park to me. So we're singing about going to a heaven where there's streets of gold and gates of pearl. But we get mad if somebody we know has a $300 watch. You know you're religious when you say things like, money's not important. Giving doesn't matter. You know how you know giving's important? Look at your children. Look at your grandchildren. I just became, I didn't tell you yet. Oh, in December, December the 10th, I became a grandfather for the first time. Oh, yeah. They asked me, what are we going to call you? I said, oh, that's easy. My grandfather was one of my best friends. He died at the age of 95. I called him Papaw. I always wanted to be somebody's Papaw. So I said, I don't care how old-fashioned that name sounds. The boy will call me Papaw. So I'm already Papaw. You see, I, I've only been around my grandson one time because he lives in another state. But I love him so much, I've already bought him stuff. I've already sent him stuff. Why? I'm his granddaddy. You think if I'm that easy and quick to give, God would be less? God would be slower? You think God's going to let a human being die and go to heaven and say, you outgave me, you outdid me, you outblessed me? You think God's going to rob himself of the privilege of being the giver in this relationship when he said, it's more blessed to give than receive? Come on, somebody. I give to Graham because I care. And you know, the moment you get a passion for people, you know that it costs to care. The more money you have, the more blessing you can do to others. The more great commission you can sponsor, the more Bibles you can print, the more rhapsodies you can pass out. Only a fool thinks money doesn't matter. Money matters because the people Jesus died for matter. And I refuse to stand before a heavenly God who said he gave me everything and told him I was satisfied with junk. He's got enough to bless me and bless you. Years ago, there was a man named Michael Bloomberg. Remember that guy? He was a billionaire that ran for president, got 1% of the vote, but he spent $450 million on TV airtime. And somebody said, there's only 450 people in America, 450 million people. If he'd just given each one of us a million dollars, he'd have the same amount spent. Everybody would be rich. So, oh, but they'd all be broke two weeks later because they wouldn't know what to do with it. But a child of God would. How many of you know a child of God would? Your first financial seed is your mouth. You say what God says. I am the head and not the tail. I am the lender, not the borrower. I'm not poor. I'm not going to be poor. Today's the poorest I'll ever be the rest of my life. I love what Pastor Chris said years ago. I'm not the poor trying to get rich. I am the rich daily discovering what I already possess. Come on, somebody. Boy, God rebuked me years ago. I was driving through a very wealthy part of Dallas with an out-of-town friend and mansions everywhere. And the guy said, man, Mike, where are we? And without thinking, I just said, we're in the rich part of town. And as soon as I said that, the Holy Spirit smote me. I knew he had corrected me. And I said, oh, I'm so sorry, Lord. I looked at my friend and said, pardon me. Let me rephrase that. We're in the part of town where I live. Hallelujah. We're in the part of town where I hang out. You've got to get your mindset right. God wants to bless you. Take the religious. How much, Mike? As much, as much, and more, and much. He said, make Jesus Lord. Let everything else come to you as he wants. And watch what God will do. Are you hearing me today? Your mind has to talk prosperity. Your mind has to talk it because this is what God requires. Number three, you have to remember you're never a bigger giver than God your Father. You're never going to be. I, I wish that you would make this a goal. I'm going to get ready to pray in a moment. But I wish you would make this a goal. I wish you would join with me. I'm going to try it too. Let's try spending the rest of our life trying to outgive God. You'll never do it. I'll never do it. But what a life we would have. Okay, Lord, you bless me with that. Watch what I'm going to bless you with. And just let the contest begin. And let your heavenly Father just keep laughing and saying, okay, nice seed, but watch this. Good measure, pressed down, shaking together, running over. You sold a house, watch them, I'm going to give you five more. You gave a car away, I got a boat for you now. You've got 100000 in the seed pocket today. I'm going to bless you with 500000 tomorrow. Come on, somebody, watch what he does. Because he said it. Good measure, pressed down, shaking together, running over. That's the law of God. 
I have to remember, he's never going to stop, stop saying stupid religious stuff like, I give expecting nothing in return. Who do we think we are? You're going to strip God of the joy of being a giver to his child? If somebody said to me, you can never bless your grandson again, I'd say you better walk out of the room fast before you get carried out because I'm going to bless my grandchildren. Come on, son. Nobody would stop me from that. You put me in the corner of a jail, I'd be praying for them, loving on them, confessing over them. Well, God's not going to stop doing that for you and me. So when you take a seed in your hand and you give it to a God you cannot see, he gets in covenant with it and kisses it and sends it back to you multiplied, good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over. Come on, give God a glorious shout. All right, I want our love world singers and musicians to come. I want you to write down this one last one because it's so powerful to me. If you let your budget decide your giving, Satan will always control your prosperity. If you let your budget make your giving decisions, Satan will always control your prosperity because God will always lead you into deeper waters. Listen to me closely. This is not the shouting part, but it's the truth part. The truth will set you free. He will always bring us into a place of an uncomfortable instruction when he's trying to get us to a new level. I'm going to have our musicians begin to play as soon as you get to the keyboard, please. And our singers are getting ready to sing in just a moment. God will nudge you about a special seed at a special time. Years ago, God had, matter of fact, I was in, I was in a building you had built, a church you had built. 2003 had just ended, 2002 had just ended, 2003 had just started. I was walking in a hallway of a church by myself praying. And God did not tell me to do this. Out of my own joy, I, I'd been thinking of how good God had been to me the previous 12 months. And I saw I, I got to start the year off with a seed. And I wanted to bless the church where I was at. So I got my checkbook out. We wrote checks way back then. And I went to write out a check for $5,000. God did not tell me to do it. There was no pre... I was by myself. I just, out of the, I just wanted to say, Lord, I love you. Thank you. You've been, it was just a seed of thanksgiving. And God did not tell me to do it. Dr. Avanzini, as I was writing the check for $5,000, he showed up uninvited. And he spoke two words to me, as clear as I'm talking to you right now. Double it. He said, double it. Oh, now i got to sow $10,000. I reminded the Lord, he didn't even tell me I had to sow the five. I would like for him to be happy about that. Proud I was doing that. But his sheep know his voice. I said his sheep know his voice. Your biggest problem is not that you can't hear from God. It's that sometimes your flesh disagrees with what you know God is saying. Because sometimes the instructions of God are illogical to your mind and your emotions. But they're never impossible for you to use your faith to obey. The Lord said to me, I want you to write that check out by 5 o'clock today. And put it on that pastor's desk. And oh, I was so, oh, just Lord, this can't be. I, I walked for two or three hours in the hallway of that church praying, Lord, this is a lot. I've never sold $10,000 before. This is, this is double what I'd planned. And the enemy began to attack my mind. I thought, Mike, this is so stupid. You've seen God show up over and over and over again. The only reason God talks to you about a seed is he's got a harvest on his mind. When I let go of what's in my hand, it's a principle. God lets go of what's in his. Not because... I'm doing something to make him like me because I'm honoring him by activating a divine law. He said, I had to sow first before I got the harvest back. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over. You see, everything's a seed. There at your house, love is a seed. Time is a seed. Mercy is a seed. Money's a seed. If I need wheat, I don't sow corn. If I need love, I don't sow patience. I reap what I sow, so my what becomes my that. I need money, so I sow finances to get a harvest of finances. The only way to have a friend is to be one. You sow the seed of friendship, you get a harvest of friends. There's not a single one of us, and you watching at your house, it doesn't need a harvest. Even if everything you've got is paid for, it. there's people you love. There's missions to support. There's Love World to sponsor. There's rhapsodies of realities to print. This gospel's got to get out. i got a crazy dream. I don't know how it's going to work out. Maybe I shouldn't say this on television. I want to go to North Korea one day. I really do. I want to find a way to, to drone drop Bibles, tracks. I, I want to get a team of South Koreans to get a... I don't know how we're going to... I want to invade 
North Korea. Well, when God opens up that door, it's going to cost some money. So I don't go around talking poverty and, oh, we can't do it. That's too big. Nothing's too big for our God. And so I, I wrote that check out for $10,000. I put it on the pastor's desk at four fifty-eight because God said you got to have it there by 5. It was a Friday afternoon, and I thought to myself, nobody's going to come back to this church until Monday, so if I go home and sleep on this a few days and decide it really wasn't God, i got time to come back and get that check before they open the doors on Monday. That's how I thought. I got home and I slapped myself a few times emotionally. I said, Mike, you idiot. You know that was God. Just watch what he does. You know what? That was the first $10,000 seed I'd ever sowed. But what did Jesus say? With the same measure you measure out, that same measuring cup's what's going to be used to measure it back to you, but it's coming back. Good measure, pressed down, shaking together and running over. At that time, nobody in my ministry had ever given me $10,000 at one time. But days after I sowed my seed, a few weeks, a man called me and said, you probably forgot, but a year ago you prayed for me. My boss owed me $120,000 in back pay, and he wasn't paying. I was going to have to get an attorney. He said, you came into a covenant with me that God would release that money. He said, today I got a check for $80,000. He said, I wanted to know your address because I wanted to send you a check for $10,000 to say thank you for praying. Come on, somebody. I got my first seed back, my harvest. Two days later, a man you know called me, said I felt led of God to send you a check for $10,000. He mailed it. About six months later, he sent another check for $10,000. Six months later, another check for $10,000. And he had no idea what I had sold. But God kept me in $10,000 harvest because I had a $10,000 seed. So I want to look to the camera right now and tell you that it's time for us to, to get serious about the provision of God. Start thinking about multiple millions in your life. Don't just ask God to make you a millionaire. Get to a place where you can sow a million dollars and not care. Are you hearing me today? I said, don't get to the place where you just want to be a millionaire. Ask God to take you to a place you can sow a million and just not care because it's coming back good measure, pressed down, shaking together. I want everybody in the audience to stand with me all across this building. And I'm going to look you right in the eye here in the camera as they're standing all across this auditorium. You there at your house. It's time to sow seed. I don't usually talk about multiple levels, but I felt so stirred all day for about four. I want to talk to you about the $1,000 seed. I really am asking the Lord. I know there's many more, but I'm asking God for 120 miracles today in the lives of 120 people who will go to the phone. Don't do it yet. It's too important. i got to pray for you. i got to release something. But when we finish this prayer, you're going to go to the phone, dial the number that's on the screen. You're going to plant your seed of $1,000. It might be money you'd set aside for a rainy day, something you thought you'd use to buy a new car, down payment on a house. I was in Australia and a kid just got saved six months early, 19 years of age. He had set aside $1,000 to buy a Corvette. That was his dream car. He didn't know about, he just got saved, didn't know about sowing and all that stuff, but he felt stirred to sow the $1,000 seed. And I told him to count off 90 days and watch what God would do. And on day 89, he met an old man at a gym who said, kid, what do you do for a living? He said, I do such and such down the street. He said, you're kidding. because I'm CEO of a company across town. He goes, I'm looking for somebody like you to do what I need done. If you'll come work for me, I'll give you every penny you're making at your job, and I'll add to it $60,000 a year. That happened on day 89. Another man walked up to me one time crying. He had a, a master's degree, and he was a real handsome guy. And he said, Mike, I'm 28, and I'm lonely. I want a wife. He said, I'd like to sow a $1,000 seed, count off 90 days, and call in a godly wife. And I laughed. He said, you think that would work? I said, if you get a good woman for $1,000, that's the best deal I've ever heard about in my lifetime. But I said, let's pray. On day 89, he met the woman he's now been married to over 15 years. I could tell you story after story. There's something powerful about this $1,000 seed. You said, Mike, I'd love to sow it. I feel God in this, but I don't have it. It's okay. You call. And sow what you can. $100 a month for 12 months. You may want to sow $200 this month and $200 the next to you paid out. You may want to sow $500 this month, $500 next month. Or you may just want to put it all in your bank card and sow it all out right now. But there's 120 plus of us going to plant this $1,000 seed. I felt real stirred as well about the $10,000 seed because God used that at such a strategic place in my life. And I've sowed many of them now. 
And I've seen harvest. So I sold a $10,000 seed once years ago. And within about seven days, somebody handed me a check for $100,000 for our ministry. And it's just kept multiplying over and over again. Today's the poorest day you ever have to be the rest of your life because this seed works. But knowing it doesn't help you. Believing it, it doesn't help you. You've got to activate and do what God said. You've got to step out and do your part. And God gets in covenant and do His. Feel real stirred about the $10,000 seed. I feel stirred that there's somebody supposed to plant 10,000 a month into Love World for the next 12 months. I feel like a pastor is going to do that out of his church because you, you've been feeling it all day. I mentioned it this morning. There's people going to sow a $100,000 seed. I've asked the Lord for five who could plant a $100,000 seed this week. And there are many who are going to sow a $1 million seed. His sheep know his voice and another they will not follow. This is your moment. Don't let these moments close with your hands closed. This is a generous God. We're getting in covenant with him to go to a whole new level. So you can be a huge blessing to your family, your church, and the work of God. Father, in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, we bow our heads and our hearts. You died and you took our sins so we wouldn't have to face the penalty of it. You took upon sickness so we wouldn't have to be sick. And you took upon poverty. So we wouldn't have to be broke. We could have your wealth. We could have your riches. You've set before us life and death, blessing and cursing. So today we choose life. I come into a covenant, Father, for 120 plus who are sowing a $1,000 seed today. I thank you, Father, for 10 that are sowing a $10,000 seed every month into Love World for the next 12 months out of their business, out of their church. Father, your sheep know your voice. They know. They know the inner prompting. And they rebuke any hesitation in their life. There's not a selfish bone in their body. They're calling and reaching for the phone. And the moment they reach for the phone, the moment they make that physical move, the moment they dial the first number on the screen is the first part of their harvest being released in heaven. Father, I thank you for five that are sowing a $100,000 seed today. And I thank you, Father, for many who are sowing a $1 million seed this week into Love World as we get so serious about taking the gospel of Jesus Christ around the world. Lord, as the Love World singers prepared to sing, we're going to go to the phone. And as we go, we're going to wrap our faith like a giant altar call to the church. We're locking arms and moving forward, supporting the Lord Jesus Christ and standing with our man of God, Pastor Chris. Today is the poorest day we'll ever be the rest of our life. In Jesus' matchless name, it is done. Now give God a mighty shout and say amen. Quickly right now, dial the number on the screen. Get your phone right now. Get it out of your hand. Call the number right now. You see it on the screen. Don't delay. Don't negotiate. This is not a time to pray about something. You already sense the, the promptings of the Holy Ghost. His sheep know His voice and another they will not follow. Dial the number on the screen right now. Plant the seed. God's impressing you to sow. You call as well. If you're at home and you see all the information for the online giving, you may want to sow online. It's safe and secure, and you can do it right now. But don't delay it. Don't say, I'll do it after dinner. I'll do it when I get off work. You'll have a thousand things come against you in those moments. Now's the time to give. As the Holy Spirit's hovering over the airwaves, now's the moment to thrust your seat into God's work. The Love World singers are going to sing. We're going to go like a mighty army to the phone. We're going to make this a bad day for the devil and unlock the mighty harvest of God right there in your life in Jesus name come on go to the phone right now love world singers you take us to the Lord
the age the company to be praised. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Son, King of King of Glory. You're watching Love World USA, building your faith with the true gospel of Jesus Christ and the vital message of our man of God, Pastor Chris Oyakolome. I want to join you and help you fulfill God's plan for your life. I feel this in my bones, people. For you, I'm feeling it. I'm telling you. We've got to display the ministry of the Spirit today. Something that is so incredibly powerful and to change the world. We must not lose today's opportunity to reach the whole world for Jesus Christ. This is your love world.
Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You sit above the cherubim.
Thank you, Lord. There's none like you. There's none like you. There's none like you. You deserve praise and adoration. Pastor Benny Hinn is right here. It's a great joy for every one of us to have you here today. And all around the world, we are waiting to hear you. Lord, thank you for bringing Pastor Benny. <laughs> Glory be to God. And of course... I've got right here Bishop Clarence McClendon, Bishop James Spain, Pastor Dan Willis, and we're going to be hearing God's word, receiving divine inspiration, and I want you to listen to everything that's coming to you today, and the ambience of the spirit that we enjoy. This moment that is transferred to you right where you are. Doesn't matter where you are in this great world today. This presence will be there. And the Lord will be ministering to you. Glory to God. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you. Thank you for this glorious moment. Thank you. For all that you would do in our hearts. For what the world will produce in us and through us. Thank you for the joy of the spirit that you've given us. We celebrate you throughout this week. And it's all for your glory. All for your glory. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. So right away, I'm going to call up Pastor Benny Hinn to proceed. Thank you. I'm so glad to be back with Pastor Chris. Amen, amen, and be back in Lagos. I pray the Lord tonight is going to speak to each heart. And to him be all the praise. And God's people said, Amen. And Lord, I thank you for what you're, you're about to do and show us. Thank you for all you've done. And thank you for what you're about to do again. To you belongs the glory. And we mean it. All the glory, honor, and praise. Only you are worthy of all the glory. And Lord, again, guide our words, touch our hearts, minister to your wonderful people throughout the world, and bless Pastor Chris and this great ministry. In Jesus' wonderful name, and God's people said, you may be seated here in the studio, and I'm so glad to be with all of you and all my friends, and I'm going to have you... Help me preach tonight. So if you'll get your Bible, you're going to stay right there where you are and read some scriptures. That's a deal. And uh, Bishop, you're going to take over after I'm done. So I'm sure you're already. Uh, I want to minister tonight something very important because I believe God Almighty is about to do something incredibly powerful in your life financially. And I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. When did God, let me ask you a question. When did God give the wealth of Egypt to Israel? Aha, uh -huh, on the way out. 
So we are on the way out. And being that we're getting so close to the rapture of the church and the coming of the Lord, there's got to come first a move of the Spirit. Because the Bible says in Acts 3 clearly that all will be restored before the Lord returns. But what is it? What, what is the all? What is the all? Well, you have to look at what happened in the book of Acts. What happened in the old covenant? What did God do then? Well, first of all, his glory was seen. When Israel came out of Egypt, what did they see? His glory. The cloud by day, the fire by night. What happened in the Old Covenant? I mean, think just for a minute. Think about what it says in Acts. All will be restored. And sometimes we have to think, does it say some? It doesn't say some. It says all things will be restored that the prophets had spoken. So we have to begin thinking what really happened that will happen again. Okay, we're, we're hearing a lot about miracles, signs, and wonders, and much more than that, of course, throughout the world, in every church, in every country. I just came from Kenya a few weeks we were there, a few weeks ago, and I never thought I'd see the day when the president and his wife would invite me to come and minister to the whole nation. I never thought it would ever happen. This only happened, I think, once before in my lifetime. Only once. And it wasn't even that big. Now you got a country like Kenya where a president who's a Christian and his wife, who's an intercessor, decide... They need a healing for the nation. And when she came to invite me, she flew all the way from Nairobi in the fall of last year. And I'm sitting there wondering, like, why is this happening? And she said, we need to repent. I said, for what? For the way we treated men of God. That's what she said. And I was stunned, like, am I hearing this? She said, we need to repent as a nation in the way we treated even you. I said, well, when I came the last time, we had a million people, and I didn't feel I was mistreated. I didn't think about it. Nobody was mean or nasty that I remember. I remember what God did. I just don't remember anything else. And that was years ago. She said, Pastor Benny, God told us to have you come so the nation can ask you, ask you to forgive us. And I did not know what to say. So on the last day, they said, would you forgive us publicly? I was not too comfortable doing that. You were there. And finally, I did, and I did in the pastor's meeting where 20,000 pastors gathered. We were only expecting 4,000. 20,000 showed up, and we had to go back to the stadium. And I'm thinking, Lord, why are you doing this? Why am I alive to see it? I should have died back in 2015. It didn't happen because I had a heart condition that could have killed me. And I'm thinking, I'm 71, and I'm here in this country, I'm in Kenya, and I'm looking at this incredible event. Now, what was so amazing wasn't so much the crowd. There were half a million people there. They used the, the stadium that seated 150,000 only because of security for the president, so they could control the security. And I'm thinking, why am I here? And I honestly tell you, I did not feel or want to pray for the sick. 
I just didn't sense that that's why I had, God had me there. Okay, you can pray for the sick and a few would, would be healed, but then the rest of them are not sick. And I looked at that platform, three platforms, not just one, three of them. On the right sat all the preachers. Every name you can imagine was there. On the left sat all the government officials. And I mean all the government officials. Hundreds of them. And behind me sat the, mainly the committee and some people. That's about it. And, I, and I'm thinking, Lord, what do you want me to say? And the Holy Spirit just like this said, the Lord's deity. I began ministering on his deity. And you could, you could feel in the crowd, awe and holiness hit that place. And the next day when the president came, his wife was there for all the meetings. He came and his entourage came with him. And I was amazed he did not leave that platform. He was there the whole time. At the end, I prayed with him, and he knelt, he and his wife. And I'm thinking, Lord, is this the beginning of the restoration? Because it says nations will be saved. It didn't say just be. It said nations will come. Nations will come. Now, what was amazing to me, to me, you have to understand why to me. I'm from Israel. The Israeli ambassador was on the platform. They all showed up because the president was there. And I'm looking at this man who's not a Christian and his wife and his staff. They, he sat almost right next to the president himself. All the officials, hundreds, each platform, I don't know how many on each platform, at least 200, 300 each on each platform. And I'm thinking, because they told us it was 600 altogether of guests on the platform, platforms. So I walk over to, because I just felt I need to pray, and I pray for the preachers here, and then I went over there. And the power of God began hitting the officials, and the wife of the ambassador was ready for me to lay hands on her, but I thought I better wait, because the next day I went and met with him for two hours, and what was amazing to me is he said, he said, you convicted me to read my Bible. Now, that's not a preacher telling me, that's an ambassador telling me. Now, that was the next day in his office. And what was even more re remarkable, he said, would you minister to my staff? What? Including the rabbi who sat there. The staff was sitting, and they all came in, and I preached Jesus. Now, wait, wait. You know, you got to understand. We're talking about Jewish people. And a rabbi. And the rabbi seemed to enjoy it, I think. And there were other staff members who were not Jews, naturally, because they had people from Kenya there, too. But I'm thinking this is not exactly something that happens every day. But I'm here to tell you something, saints. And, I, and I, I'm not prophesying. I'm not saying thus as the Lord. I'm just speaking as someone who's been there for a while in ministry. I have never seen this before. And I thought to myself about the times I had gone to other countries. Uh, I was invited, for example, to Indonesia, and the government paid for the crusade. But that was years ago. A Muslim government paid 
for the crusade. And I thought that was something big too. Now I'm thinking this is bigger, way bigger. And I don't want to say any, any more to you except you can sense something that triggered in the atmosphere. Especially when they all prayed at the end. Here's the president on his knees, his wife on her knees, officials on their knees, asking God to bless their life. And, and since then, I've been invited now to go to Uganda for the same thing. The wife of the president was on her knees the day I was preaching in Kenya, sent me a message, and she said, you tell Benny, and I'm on my knees praying, he'll come here now. So is this the beginning, maybe, of the transformation to begin and restoration to begin in Africa? Will God use Africa? Is that his plan, to use Africa to literally ignite a new move of the Spirit? I think so. How many of you believe that? That Africa may very well be the continent that will ignite the world with the power of God. Is it possible that God has a bigger plan for Nigeria than you even know about? Is it possible that God will have or already has a bigger plan for Tanzania? Because they came from all over Africa. Pastors and people came from all over. They told me that publicly. They said they've come from every country in Africa. And I'm thinking, Lord, why are you doing this now? While the world is about to enter the most dangerous moment in history. I mean, who thought we would hear about nuclear war? Repeatedly now, it's just not one thing you hear. You're, you're hearing it more than once. Any of the troubles out there, whether it's the Ukraine or Russia or Iran or North Korea that has just now, their leader is preparing for war. It said so yesterday in the news. Or the situation with, with Israel or Gaza, anything can trigger that in no time. The world is on edge as never before. Well, here's what the book of Isaiah said. Gross darkness will cover the earth first. And then gross darkness will cover the people of the earth. These are two separate events. Gross darkness will cover the earth and then the people of the earth. I have a friend, a pastor, John Kilpatrick. He's a man of God. He had a vision a few days ago, a very powerful one. And he was telling me about it. He actually came to be with us a few weeks ago. We had a celebration uh, my children, Michael and Jessica, have a big ministry now called Jesus Image. And they just had their big conference. 10,000 people at least were there. And John came, Pastor John. And in the back, he was telling me about his vision. That God showed him that the earth is now responding in pain to the sins of humanity. What he said was, how when Adam sinned, the earth began to feel the pain of his sin. Because God said now the, the, the earth will no longer bring forth. You have to plow it. So the earth responds negatively to the sins of humanity. And it was quite powerful what he said. He said these, these events on earth now because of the sins of men that have increased so greatly, the earth will, will respond with greater earthquakes, greater 
troubles, manifestations in the weather, and such things. Well, I mean, these things have happened already. We've all seen the effects. Uh, I went through two, two hurricanes, two already in Florida. It, it's not pleasant at all. I live by the ocean. Those waves were so massive, it was mandatory evacuation twice. I, I never have seen the ocean so violent as I saw during that hurricane. I thought for sure it's going to be all right. It wasn't. Mandatory. We had to leave because of flooding. And I never thought I'd see such wrath, rage, hit those waves. Pastor Tom, I, I've lived by the ocean for years. I was born in Jaffa. I never saw that. I lived in California on the Pacific Ocean, right on the shore or close to it. I never saw that. But last year, those waves were beyond massive and violent winds to the place, and it wasn't even the eye of the hurricane or close to it. So the world is going to experience more of it. And possibly this year, I don't want to scare you, but possibly this year, unless we pray, unless we pray, and Global Day of Prayer is coming up this Friday and Saturday, unless we pray, there could be something that will trigger, God forbid, but we have to believe God, it won't happen, between China and the United States. Something could be triggered on the oceans of, of, of the world. The, the, the situation with, with Taiwan is on edge. So, why am I saying this? Well, because the Bible says, gross darkness will cover the earth, and then gross darkness will cover the people of the earth before the coming of the Lord. But what does it say to the, to the church? It says, the glory of the Lord. The glory of the Lord will be seen upon you. So on one hand, great light in the church. On the other hand, great darkness, gross darkness. And God will, will, will literally produce equally the light. As the darkness gets deeper, the glory will get greater. Equally, equally. Remember that when God brought Israel out of Egypt, the Egyptians saw what? Darkness. And the Jewish people saw light because they always come together. And this year, I, you know, we haven't been here since 2019. This is 2024. And now we're back together. Again, could it be that God Almighty has arranged it this way to prepare you, the church, for what God will do this year, not next year? This year. I don't believe in Nostradamus. I, I, I don't believe he's a man of God. I don't believe he was. But some of his prophecies are now being republished about 2024. I don't know. He was accurate on some stuff. Some he wasn't. But he said two things will happen in 2024. We'll, we'll, we'll watch and see. Number one, that the Pope will abdicate. The present Pope will leave his place in 2024. Secondly, that he said the king of England will also abdicate. He said that. He wrote that. I saw it on the news. I don't read Nostradamus. I am intrigued by what that man said. Whether he's from the devil or from God, only God knows that. Now let's see 
if the Pope this year will leave the papacy. Let's see if King Charles will no longer be king after this year. But I don't care what the man said. I care what the Bible says. Because the word, and I said that to get your attention, because some of you are falling asleep. Not you. I'm talking to them. If you, if you ever fall asleep on me, I would take my bottle of water and splash your face and wake you up. You shall not. That's very good. I want to wake them up. They are asleep spiritually. You are asleep. Some of you, you are spiritually asleep on the edge of eternity. You are drowsing off on the edge of eternity. Be careful. I'm not here to raise money. I'm here to wake you up. And if you don't wake up, you're a fool. Because you see it all around you. Look what's happening all around you. I don't care if you like me or not. If you don't, it doesn't, it's not going to affect me one bit. I know who I am. I just want to warn you because I don't want your blood on my hands. Wake up. It's time to awake out of sleep, Paul wrote. Get your knees all strong again. And let's get moving for the king of heaven. You sang, and you, we heard the beautiful words of the song you sang earlier. You're holy, Lord. You're wonderful. You're great. Well, he is to us. Now, in some places in the church, people are asleep. Now, I asked a question earlier. When did God bless Israel? On the way out. And I'm here to tell you, we're about to leave. We're about to go home. We're about to be with the Lord. Come, Lord Jesus. Lift your hands and say it. One more time. With all your heart, one more time. That's our cry. That's the cry of the church. So God Almighty does not want you leaving this world defeated or lacking. Now you have to ask yourself another question. What did God give Israel on the way out, and why? Why? Well, he gave them the wealth of the Egyptians. Now, people will mock that. Say, well, what has this got to do with God's plan? Oh, it has a lot to do with God's plan. Because God gave them the wealth of the Egyptians to build his house, his tabernacle. And before we leave, we have got to begin building for the kingdom in a way we've never built for the kingdom before. We have to increase and enlarge our vision. We have to enlarge our capacity of faith. So Moses built the tabernacle. And all the gold that was used in it came out of Egypt. All the silver came out of Egypt. All the jewelry came out of Egypt. Everything came out of Egypt. All the animals for sacrifice came out of Egypt. And people don't think about how powerful the miracle was where God kept the animals alive for 40 years in a desert. In a desert. We hear about the water come, you know, coming out of the rock for the people. But how about the cattle? In their hundreds of millions. Hundreds of millions. 
We, we, we know six million came out with Moses. That's people. But how about animals? How many animals? If you just would think about the offerings they gave daily, daily, the daily offerings of animals, it would fill 12 semis a day. You know, do you see those big trucks on the highways? 12 would, those animals would fill 12 of them every day because the people brought their sacrifices to God. Because God said, I want two lambs in the morning and two in the evening. I want oxen. I want goats. I want birds. I want meat offerings, meaning bread. I was, I was amazed when I began studying the five offerings mentioned in Leviticus. Five of them. Each one is the Lord. Quite powerful. And Israel had to offer all that daily. Forty years of it. And think about all the animals that were offered because someone sinned. Out of six million, there's a lot of sinning going on. And they all had to bring their, their animals. Those priests were busy day and night. The fire on the altar of sacrifice didn't go out day and night. Twelve semis? How did they stay alive? We have a big God. So what are you worried about? Nothing. Lift your hand and say, I have a big God. Say it again. Say it again. Now say, I will not settle for a cupful when the ocean belongs to me. Say it again. Say it again. Ah, don't forget that. He promised us the ocean. He didn't promise us just a cup. The ocean. There was a friend who did not know what the ocean looked like, and a friend of his said, I'll show you. I heard that story from Catherine Kuhlman. Two friends, one lived by the ocean and one had never seen the ocean. So the friend that lived by the ocean said to the friend that never saw the ocean, I will show you what the ocean looked like, looks like. So he took a cup from his house and went down to the ocean and put some of the ocean in the cup and took it to his friend who lived miles away. He said, this is the ocean. It wasn't the ocean. It was only a cup full. That's how some of you are living. You've never seen the ocean. It's yours, though. You've never seen, because all you've seen is a cup full of salt water from the ocean. Lift your hands and say, Lord, I'm ready for, for the ocean. I don't want no cups no more. Say, say, I don't want any more cups. I want the ocean. Well, that's what's coming. Hello, did you hear me? That's what's coming. We have seen cupfuls of prosperity. Now the ocean is on the way. Because it's coming before the coming of the Lord. So God kept them blessed in Egypt. He gave them cucumbers and he gave them leaves and fish and all that they ate. That's just cup here and cup there. But before they left the land, God gave them the ocean. He said, go and spoil the Egyptians. Now, Egypt was the greatest superpower of the day. More money, more wealth in Egypt in those days than any country on earth. But who took it all? The church. Why? To build a tabernacle. To glorify the Lord, to build his house. What did Jacob say to the Lord? He said, Lord, if you'll, if you'll go with me and bring me back, I'll give you 10%. And I'll build you your house. This place, Bethel, will be your house, which became God's house later. It became the center of ministry besides Gilgal in the nation of Israel. Samuel would go to, to Bethel regularly. It was where Jacob made the vow. 
Now, God Almighty is about, and I said all I said earlier to let you know, the time. This is high time. This is great high time for us to wake up and realize there's coming a mighty move of God. Greater than you'll ever know. Ever know. Leaders from around the world will be calling upon men and women of God to come and pray for them. They have no answers. They have no answers. Years ago, there was a man out of Miami, very powerful, influential man, who took me to Washington twice. He had helped Ronald Reagan become president. His name was Bob, and for some reason, he and I connected. So he said to me, he said, I want you to come with me and meet all the senators in Washington. I, I, I didn't believe that he could do it, but boy, did he ever. So I walk into the office of a senator named Snow, or last name is Snow, and I, I literally, he opened the whole Congress to me and the Senate. I went in and, and prayed with every congressman he knew and you name it and all of them. And the senator says to me, a lady, Senator Snow, she says, how refreshing it is you've come to ask for nothing. You just come to pray for me. How refreshing. They all said that to me. Because they thought I was going to come and ask for some favor. Uh -uh. I said, I'm just coming to pray with you. I never thought I would see such response from people who were not exactly born again, but who wanted prayer. Wanted prayer. And they were so grateful and thanked me for praying for them. I think the day is coming. We're going to see invitations coming our way from presidents, prime ministers, royal families to go and pray with them because they have no answers. The world today is at a place of such confusion and darkness and fear. They don't know what to do because they don't know what they're doing already. Nothing is working. And the church is the answer to the world's problems. And if we do not do our job, God will judge us. Because this is an hour as never before. Elisha stood with the king of Israel who was not exactly righteous. And said, shoot those arrows. And the man didn't shoot as many as he should have. And he rebuked him for his disobedience. But he did win three battles, didn't he? Because of the man of God. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to prophesy something. I don't believe that Pastor Chris is on this property by accident. I believe God gave him this property for something bigger than he knows and bigger than you know. With all our frailties, for we are human beings, with all our frailties, God is bigger than any man. And he will use us as we are to accomplish his will. For the nations. I said for the nations. For his name's sake. For his name's sake. I was told by Pastor Tom and then Pastor Chris told me. And I somewhat forgot that the last time I was here I prophesied about this property. Well, it's happening. But I'm here to tell you it's a bigger plan than you all know. Because God is about to literally open the heavens over our lives. Are you, are you listening? 
Are you ready for it? Well, then you, you need to get your faith equal with that. Remember, I just said, the ocean is yours. Say that. Say it again. Say it again. Well, get there by faith. Get there. Don't just say it. Believe it. Believe it. Begin to believe it. A man of God named Fred Roberts in 82 in South Africa told me, he said, God's going to use you in the last days to prepare the church for the coming of the Lord. I did not really believe it then. I began to, to believe it later. But at that time, I wasn't uh, seeing it. I thought he was being nice. He wasn't being nice. He was prophesying. A man of God named Fred Roberts, he was an apostle in Durban, South Africa. Established many churches in South Africa. And today I'm thinking, he told me that. And others like him. I didn't really see it like I see it now. In the late 70s, I walked into a house in Jerusalem. I went with friends of mine from the catacombs. I wasn't in the ministry yet. I wasn't preaching yet. The Watsons took us and two friends from the catacombs said, we want to introduce you to this lady who is a prophetess. Never even heard her name. They had just evacuated the, the embassies out of Jerusalem. Nations were leaving Jerusalem and moving to Tel Aviv. Embassies were moving out of Jerusalem. So a lot of embassies became available for sale. Because prior to that, the embassies of the world were in Jerusalem. And now with all the political chaotic stuff, they began leaving and going to Tel Aviv. So this woman, with her ministry, bought or leased one of the embassies. So I walked to, the, to this door. And with me is my friend David and his, and his wife, Lisa Loden. The man's name was David Loden and Lisa Loden. I'll never forget them. And they, they wrote some songs years ago that the church sang Hebraic songs. So I walk to that big door, and there stands this woman, tall, white shoulders. And before she said anything, thus says the Lord. That's how she started. Didn't even say hello. Named Ruth Heflin. Ruth Heflin was her name. Thus says the Lord, I will bring you before kings and presidents and prime ministers. You will preach to millions. And then she said, what's your name? That's how she started. What's your name? I, I, I was shocked. I, 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 I forgot what my name was. <laughs> she said, thus is the Lord. I, for, I forgot all about me. And everything she said happened. I was, I was 20 or somewhere there, years of age. Dear Ruth Heflin, she became my friend later, but I was, I was stunned by that woman. But she prophesied on my life, but I didn't see it. I never thought I could even be in the presence of a president. I would have been all tied up. I thought, what king? I don't know. I've walked into the palace of King Hussein of Jordan years ago. I'm friends with his son, who's the king now. He had me preach in Amman and gave me his soldiers to protect me. I was the first preacher to ever preach the gospel at the palace of culture in Amman with 5,000 people that came. 
And the king of Jordan gave me permission. And now his son, Abdullah, I gave him the Bible. I said, you're, you're in the Bible. He said, where? I opened Isaiah 16. I said, here, it mentions you in Isaiah 16. He was stunned. But that woman knew it. And I'm here telling you, the ocean is coming your way. Will you believe that? I didn't believe it when she said what she said. But I'm telling you now, I'm 71, I'm not 20 anymore. The ocean is coming your way. God's mighty ocean. Lift your hands, say, Lord, I'm ready. The blessings that are coming your way cannot be described. You people better stop praying in tongues right here, right now. Come on, I want to hear you. The glory of God cannot and will not be described. It cannot be. It's greater than your faith. You don't even have enough faith to see it or believe it. Greater, much greater than your faith. This is what it says. Exceeding abundantly above all we ask or even think to ask God. That's what's coming. You have to expect it. You have to believe it. It's time. Lord, we praise you. It's coming. Lift your hands and Lord, I praise you. It's coming my way. Come on, say, Lord, I praise you. It's coming my way. Your wave of blessing. The ocean itself, full of your glory. Hallelujah. The Bible says that the knowledge of the Lord will cover the earth as the oceans cover the sea. God's glory is coming your way. But if you miss it, it's your fault. Sit down. What do we do to be ready? Well, first of all, we seek the Lord. Get to know his word in, in, in a way you've never known the word of God. Get to really know his mind. Through scripture. This is where it all begins. God is about to give you a gift you've never had. D did you hear that? The Lord is about to give you a gift you've never known. If I walked over to Bishop here, this bishop here, and said, God told me to give you a new car. He'd be a happy man. Amen. He, he'll, he'll rejoice. God has promised us life eternal. It's a gift. But if I gave this man a car, it, it's no good without gasoline. Now, I give him the car, but he better get the gas. God gives us a gift. We find the gas. Without the gas, the car is no good. Without the gas, the gift is no good. You can have a car brand new in the garage. Somebody gives you a car brand new, the keys with it. But it, it, it's no good till you go to the gas station. And the gas will not come to you. You have to go and find it. God gave us the gas. It's his word. The gasoline is his word. And it will not show up in your tent. Go find it. God said to Israel, I'm going to send you manna, but it will not show up in your tent. Go find it out there. They had to leave their tent, their comfort zone, go out to the desert where it's hot and dry and find the manna. We have a job. Let's go get the gas. God is sending you a gift you've never known. You talk about prosperity, oh, come on. It's way bigger than that. It's way bigger than that. Your fridge will be full of food without you going shopping. Your bank account will have money without you even putting it in. What are you talking about? You say, well, that's impossible. Well, there, that's where you are. 
Nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible. The same God that took a lunch from a boy and fed the multitudes with it, don't you think he can do it again? The God that filled, filled Jerusalem with food in a night, the famine broke. Elisha said, it's going to happen. And the Syrians left with their tents full. And a city almost dead with famine, the next morning had everything they needed and more. All the gold, all the silver, all the food. It was in every tent because God said it's all yours. What did God give Israel? Come on. He gave them a land that wasn't theirs. Seven nations. He said, I'm going to give you farms you haven't sown in, houses you haven't built. And it happened. Where is your faith? Where is your faith? Is it in God or in business? Is it in God or in you? Is it in God or your preacher? In God. Nothing is impossible with God. Not to God, with God. With God means he needs a partner. You better get it. It doesn't say nothing is impossible to God. It says with God. Meaning God needs someone to agree with him. Ah, you got it. Will you agree with him? All right. God needs a partner. He needs someone to say, yes, Lord, use me. I am the vessel. Use me. Do it through me. And I'm there for you. And I'm there with you. Oral Roberts used to say, God will not, will not do it without you. And you cannot do it without him. Say, God will not do it without me. Say it again. Lift your hands. Say it again in your home. God will not do it without me. And say, I cannot do it without him. So it's coming. Prosperity is small in comparison to what's coming. I think when we think of prosperity, we think something down to my level. My bills paid, whatever. God says, forget your level. You're about to swim in it. I'm serious. You're about to swim in it. No limit. Say no limit. No limit to his blessings. No, not whatsoever. No limit. The only people who put the limit is you. Take the limits off. Take the limits off. Hello, no limit. Say no limit. But he's got to trust you. He's got to trust you. God could not have trusted me with Kenya 10 years ago. I, oh, of course, I had to prove myself faithful to him. God cannot give you a nation if you're not faithful enough to prove yourself. You have to show yourself worthy of trust. And that happens when you serve. When you give, when you do what's expected of you, I'm not talking about money. And if anybody, anyone thinks I am, you're the problem, not me. You've got the problem. I don't have it. I'm talking about something so big. It's way bigger than money. What are you talking about? I am talking about God's plan. God's plan now for your tomorrow, for your future. Bigger than anything that has to do with anything earthly. Or bills being paid or all that. That's just, that's little stuff. Little stuff. He's able to do what now? One more time. What? Wait, wait, wait. Exceedingly? Abundantly above what we... 
Wait, above what? Oh. You know, Paul talks about the exceeding greatness of God's power towards us who believe. Say the exceeding greatness of his power. Say it again. Towards who? Towards you. Now, now, let me just give you a little, a little idea here. Corruptions all around you. Dangers around you. Corruptions within you. Dangers within you. Now, two years ago, a year ago, excuse me, I went through those hurricanes. Now, Bishop Clarence McClendon, I don't think you've ever been in a hurricane, maybe an earthquake. But if I held a candle on that day, and I stood out there with those winds blowing at 80 miles an hour, 80 miles an hour, that caused that ocean to become violent, that an order was released of mandatory evacuations. If I stood out there with that candle and that candle stayed lit, I'd say, that's power. I'd say, that's a miracle. That the storms could not put that candle off. There's a candle inside of you. And there's more forces at work in and outside of you, bigger and stronger than any hurricane. Yet the light is still light. It's still shining. Who's, who's, who's keeping it? Who's behind it? God Almighty. If I took that candle in my hand last year and went into the ocean itself and it was underwater and it stayed lit, I'd say, that's a miracle. You are surrounded by an ocean of evil. You're surrounded by an evil, dark ocean all around you, yet that light is still shining. He is, he's promised us that he is the power that is keeping us. For it says, exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead. Hear me now. It took more power to save you. More power at work in your life today. And more, dear God, I'm about to shout. And more power to transform you into the image of Christ than the power it took to create the world. When God created Adam, he went from dust to dust. But when God created you, the church, he is turning dust into his likeness. Whoa, my. Think about what I'm saying. All the power that God used on Adam did not change him into his likeness. He went from dust to dust. He said, from dust you are to dust you're going back. But you and me, the power at work in our lives is greater than the power that created the world. Greater than the power that created man. Because dust to dust, that's limited power. But the exceeding riches of his power towards us, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, is about to transform this piece of dust into the image of Christ Jesus. That's power. Lift your hands and thank you for what's coming your way. And you're talking about money? Are you kidding? We're talking about power that is at work in us now. Transforming us day by day into the image of his son. And you're worried about your bills to be paid? 
What level of faith is that? That's below zero faith. Get out of there. And start believing for bigger things. Lift your hands, say the ocean is coming my way. Say it again. Not a couple, but the ocean. God has promised us. Now, you know, I think when we talk prosperity, we go to low levels. We go to much low levels because it's about natural things. But God wants us to go beyond that. Beyond that. The disciple says, Lord, uh, there's thousands of people here. Uh, how can you feed them with just a lunch? He saw more than that. His faith was way higher than theirs. Oh, here's Moses standing, the ocean in front, the Egyptians behind him. In the natural, it, 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 you think he's trapped. The nation of Israel said, we're doomed. The Egyptians behind us, the ocean before us, we're going to drown or die. But Moses did not see the Egyptians or the ocean. He saw God. He was in the spirit, higher level faith. Are you, are you listening? He saw the Lord. And by faith, that ocean split. What are you looking at? What are you looking at? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil. Why? You're with me. David did not see the valley. He saw the Lord. What are you looking at? The Lord or the, or the valley? Lift your hands and say, Lord, increase my faith. Come on. Remove the scales of my eyes. Take it off, Lord. I don't want to see anymore in the, that limited world of mine. It's way bigger. Way bigger than you and I. Way bigger than you and I. You all know the story. In the book of Numbers, they went in the promised land. Oh, there's giants. We look like grasshoppers. Really? No, we're the giants. We're the giants. So we were grasshoppers, it says. They said because of their lack of faith. We were as grasshoppers in their sight and our sight. Look, the way you see yourself is the way the devil sees you. Did you hear that? Say, the way I see myself is the way the devil sees me. Well, be free from that grasshopper mentality. Well, we saw giants and we all looked like, ah, uh -uh, no, no more, no more. You lend and not borrow. You're the head and not the tail. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? Say, Lord, I am the head. Say, I am the head. I am the head. Don't you lower yourself to become the president of any country. Don't you lower yourself to become the president of any nation. You hold a higher position than any king on earth. I will not lower myself to become the king of England. He can have it. I serve the king of kings. The Lord of lords. Not some government or kingdom or monarchy. I have a higher place than any man on earth. Why? I'm serving the Lord. I'm serving the Lord. Predestined before the foundation of the world. Chosen in him before the God in heaven. Before the foundation of the world. To be holy and blameless before him in love. God has set his heart upon you. He calls you his treasure. I said, he calls you his treasure. Say, I am his treasure. Say, I am his treasure. Then don't worry about the little things. You are his inheritance and he's your inheritance. Did you hear that? He is your inheritance. And you are his inheritance. An inheritance demands what? What? Death. You cannot receive an inheritance till someone dies. And God said, I give you an inheritance. And he died for it. Oh, my God. 
You have an inheritance bigger than you'll ever know. Say, all is mine. Lift your hands, say, all is mine. One more time. Do you believe it? That's what it says in the Bible. All is yours. No limit. Say, no limit. Why are you limiting God? Because you live in low levels of faith. I haven't even gotten to my message. I just want you to change your vision. Whew. The young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they that seek the Lord will not lack nothing. Read Psalm 34:10 for me. Come on, let's go. Let's get into some of a part of what I was planning on saying. And then you're next. You, you, you're going to take that thing over, brother. Yay! The young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they that seek the Lord shall not want. Shall not want any good thing. Your inheritance is way bigger than money. Way bigger than paying your bills and buying a house. All these things are natural things. Yeah. One day you're going to own the world. You're going to judge angels. Are you listening? Yeah. You're going to judge the world and the angels. Seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You know, the older I get, the more I believe in predestination but not predetermination. We all are responsible before God. When you realize God has set his heart upon you before the foundation of the world, you become very determined to finish well. I don't know if you heard what I said. When you say to yourself, he loves me that much, that he loved me before the world was formed. He set his heart on me before he created angels. The world. He knew my name. Before all that, I better serve him well. I will not fail such love. I will not walk away from such love. It's not about today's world. This is only a test. Look, giving is about what God can trust you with tomorrow. I mean eternity. Everything we do on earth is a test. Our serving, our loving, our worship, our giving... It's all a test. You think God will give you the invisible if you are not trusted with the visible? That's what Jesus said in Luke. If you cannot be trusted with the filthy mammon, who will trust you with real riches, true riches? True riches are not money. That's the invisible Magnificent promises of God coming our way. Money is simply how much can God trust you with tomorrow? With the visible, God can tell what you can do with the invisible. My giving determines my position and my living in eternity. It's about trust. And Jesus said, if you cannot be trusted with that filthy mammon, who will trust you with true riches? He wasn't talking about money when he said true riches. He meant position. More than that. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Psalm 115 verse 14. You know, money is only an expression of faith. 
if you cannot give God your money, you have not given him your heart. Because when you give him your heart, everything else is his. Everything is his. But these people who attack us focus on the money, the money, the money. That's low thinking. That's not thinking right. We are on a higher level than that. Don't insult us by bringing us down to your level. I never think about money. I think on how will I finish. And I have decided to finish stronger than I began. Yes, yes, yes. I will not enter heaven to be ashamed. Because he gave me enough to hold on to. I have enough in, the, in, in Scripture that promises me what I will have if I do what God has commanded me to do in this life. In this life. Yes. Paul, in, in 2 Corinthians, talks about the treasure that awaits when we give. Same in Philippians. That word receive is receipt. In Philippians. When he talks about giving and receiving, the word receiving is receipting. Every time you give, God gives you a receipt for what you're going to get in eternity. You can't buy it. Only a fool believes that. It's an expression, an act of faith is all it is on our part. So in Psalm 115, verse 14, it says, The Lord will increase you more and more. That means no limit to the increase. And your children, if they'll serve him. Yeah. Now, let's, let's look at Deuteronomy 28, 12 and 13. The Lord will open unto thee his good treasure, the heaven to give the rain unto your land in his season, to bless all the work of your hand. And you lend unto what? Nations. Not just people. Nations. You lend to many nations. That's big stuff. Wow. That's on a level we haven't seen yet, have we? So everything you do today is a test. You're being tested. Well, we're at the end of our journey, saints. We're at the end of the race, some of us, like me. This whole world is about to come to an end. It may be this year. Come, Lord Jesus. So God can do something very quickly with you if you will do the right thing. Romans 12, verse 1 and verse 2. Pastor Dan, would you read that for me, please? I beseech you, I beseech therefore. I beseech you, therefore, brethren. That's it. By the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. How amazing that worship includes the physical world. Our bodies. We are to present our bodies to God. Read that again, verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that, that ye present your body as what? A living sacrifice. Holy. Holy acceptable, acceptable unto, unto God. Which is what? Your reasonable service. Now, that means worship. Now, your finances, 
People don't understand how important God sees that. Because, again, you're in the test. You're, 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 you're being tested with what can God trust you with in eternity? Your service includes your giving. Because your giving represents your time, represents your strengths, represents your talents, and your inheritance. So John said, I wish above all things you prosper, be in health even as your soul, physically, spiritually, and financially. So if you fail, if you are defeated, or you get frustrated, that's not God's will for your life. Can we go to Matthew 6, 24, please? Let's read that. You know, I'm bringing you down to your level because I want to show you that this is only the testing ground for the greater, for the much greater. Don't cling on to what is natural. It's not where you're going. You're going much higher than that. Are you people listening? Yes, sir. You see, everything I do, everything I do, at my age now, I think about how does God view what I'm doing and how will it affect my position in eternity? Because when you get to the end of your race, that's what you think about. How will I finish? And then you, th you think about the, the, the times you've wasted and you ask God to help you catch up. Redeem the time. Don't blow it. Be careful. This is not something to play with. It's your life and eternal position and eternal destiny. So, Matthew 6, 24, please. No man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Now, mammon, by the way, has nothing to do with money. Mammon is the evil power that grips an individual, enslaving that individual through the medium of money. Money is neither good or bad. Money is money. Money is money. Only paper or coins, whatever currency you're using. It's how you use it. What do you do with it? Because your attitude towards money reveals your attitude towards the Lord. I repeat, you're in a test. This life is a test. What are you doing with your time, your talents, your inheritance, your life? It's a test. What's important to you? God's work or your children's future? God's work or your business? You're taking nothing with you, brother. Naked you've come and naked you're going. So stop it. Think about what I'm talking about. People spend their energy and they become so connected and so a part of the norm and the natural stuff, it's sickening to watch. Oda Roberts and Evelyn Roberts were telling me about a lady who was their neighbor. Now, the lady that cleaned their house also cleaned their neighbor's house. So they lived in Newport Beach, California, in a very simple apartment. Or Roberts had a simple 
life when he was old. Nothing big, nothing great. Just a little apartment they lived on. They lived in, in Newport Beach. But not far from their home was a big mansion a few miles down the road. And in the mansion lived this woman who went to Italy repeatedly to buy statues, statues of whatever statues they were. So this lady, when she was young and energetic, she'd fly to Italy to buy statues of all kinds of whoever they were, people. And other things, statues, flowery statues and animal statues, just statues. And, and, and she came one day because she used to clean the, the statues for her, for her whatever boss she worked for. So she came to see Oral and Evelyn. She said, you know, this morning I saw something really strange. The lady that had been buying statues all her life, guys, all her life, as she got older, she uh, could not walk, so she had to be on a wheelchair. And she had this lady, this lady who cleaned her house, wheel her every morning because she was checking the statues, checking them. So the day came when, when she was getting older and she knew she was very ill about to die. So she says to the lady who cleaned her house, who told Oral and Evelyn what happened that day, because she cleaned the big house in the morning and Oral and Evelyn's apartment in the afternoon. She said, you won't believe what happened this morning. She said, well, I've been wheeling that lady on her wheelchair every morning to check to make sure everything is right, no cracks in those statues that she spent all her money on. But that morning she was kissing them. She asked the lady, would you help me up out of my wheelchair? Kissing every statue. And she was crying as she's kissing this marble, whatever statue. And there were hundreds of them down this ho long hallway. Long hallway, Bishop. She said two, three hundred statues in that house down the hallway. And she wanted to kiss every one of them. And she was crying, kissing them. And she said to the lady who was helping her, who was pushing the wheelchair and helping her up every time to kiss another statue. Oh, she said, oh, how, how I wish I can take them with me. Because she was dying. How I wish I can take them with me. I'm going to miss my statue. Crying. Crying. <laughs> oh, my. How blind people are. So she comes to Oral and Evelyn, and she tells them that story. She says, I saw this woman today weeping, hugging and kissing her statues, pleading if there's any way she can take them with her into the grave. Aha, my. That's how you, some, some of you are. You want to hold on to all your money. All your treasures, all your wealth, how foolish you've been. God is requiring your soul. Who then will take all that money you've spent your life on building? All the business and all the nonsense you've spent your life building. You're leaving naked, brother. And I mean empty, in and out. We're not leaving empty. What you do for Christ will last. Only what you do for him, you'll take with you. Are you listening? Only what you do for him has life and meaning. Not the statues. Not the business. Not the house. Your son or your daughter will take it over or they'll fight over it most likely. And you're going to lose it all. I am shocked 
I am beyond shocked when I hear how a family fights over the inheritance of a mommy or a daddy who've died. They go to court. They become bitter enemies over possessions. Who's got the will? Who, who, who's got the money? <gasps> how blind they are. Uh-uh. We are in the book. That's the will. What you do for Jesus will last. Not for yourself. And giving to God is our expression. Lord, we're not tied up with this nonsense. Can I say it again? Every time you give, you say, I'm free from this. Are you, are you hearing me? Every time I give, I say, I'm not connected to this. I, th this means nothing to me. Let's praise him for this. Come on. The freedom we have, you see how bound they are to their statues, to their mansions, their money, their bank accounts, that their families fight over it. They begin hearing each other for dollars. Who's getting the moolah? Who's getting the money? Not about God. Not about eternity. Not, not about what God will trust you with. You can be, you will not be trusted with nothing. For you have wasted your life on nothing. Less than nothing. All your oil, business, your houses, your bank accounts, below zero. It's not even zero, it's below zero. Only what you do for Christ will last. He will not be all to you till he is all you have. The richest people in the world are poor. Without Jesus, they're poor. But the poorest people with Jesus are rich. Where do you stand? <sighs> Seek ye first what? Come on, Matthew 6, 33, please. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. And his righteousness. And? And all these things. Now, you know, I'm really getting into your, inside of you guys. And you too, I hope. Because I, I, I've lived long enough to see this nonsense. Pastor Chris, I walked into the house of a man who owned all the malls in, Southern, in South Florida. A friend of mine named Bill Swad asked me to go pray for him. Pastor Dan, I walked into this mansion, and I mean palatial mansion. Palatial. Black marble, pink marble, you name all the, the beautiful colors on the floor. And the butler opens the door. The man who owned all the malls of South Florida, Miami, Fort Lauderdale, all that, was dying with cancer. So I was asked to pray. So I went to see this man, and I see this very beautiful woman coming to greet me. Young woman, maybe in her late 20s. I'm thinking she's the daughter, but she was the wife of the man. So I walk in, I see this old man laying on the couch, skin and bones, skin and bones. So Bill Swart said, that the, the family wanted me to pray for the man. That man was so drugged on medicine, he did not even know that I was there. He did not even know I was there. So I walk in, and the first thing I'm thinking, is he going to hell or heaven? He was dead already, almost. So I did this. I said, sir, I, I was actually quite loud. Sir! 
do you know Jesus? And, and all he could do is, ah. he, he could not even talk. Ah. The lady, his wife, his young wife, and you know why she married him, does this to me. She says, that's not what he needs. I said, I know what I'm doing, lady. Sir, and the whole time she's tapping me. She wanted me to lay hands on him and fix him all up. You know, he was gone already. Sir, do you know Jesus? I'm thinking the guy is about to die. He did not even respond. He said, ah. I walked out of that house. I said, Bill. Bill Swad was with me. I said, Bill, all the money he's got means nothing. I said, that pretty girl will probably get it all. That's probably why she married him anyways in the first place. Come on, let's be real, brother. Why would a young girl that pretty marry an old guy like that? Mullah. Told that that's all they do it for. It's not love. It's greed. No way to explain. There's no other way to describe it. I'm thinking, all that money he spent his entire life building those malls. And now he's dying. He looked terrible with bones and skin on top. <gasps> How sad. Only for Jesus. Say it. Only for Jesus. So seek ye first what? The kingdom of God and his righteous cause. And all these things. Dear God, I feel the anointing just saying it. And all these things shall be added unto you. In Colossians 3 5, it says that idolatry is forbidden. Read that for me. Colossians 3, verse 5. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil, and covetousness, Covet which is idolatry. idolatry. You know, when people want money, it's as bad as fornication. What does it say? It says so. It says mortify your members on the earth, fornication, anything unclean, anything that is not pure in your affections, anything evil. And covetousness is in that same line, which is what? Idolatry. Some people don't worship God. They just worship money. Money is their God. You're as evil as one who is sleeping with women every day. Because you, you are worshiping money. They worship their sin, they don't give it up. They spend their money on it. They love it. You know how you can tell a Christian from a non-Christian? The believer hates his sin. The unbeliever loves it. That's, that's the headline. You can assure yourself of salvation when you hate your sin. Anyone who hates his sin, it means God is in you working. Helping you hate it and not want it. And the first thing you do is say, I'm sorry, Lord, and you repent like this. They don't repent. They keep doing it. So in the Bible, it says very clearly, run away from it, that covetousness. Let's go to Psalm 96, and then I'm done. I can go on, but I, I, you're next. I think I've worked quite good today. Now, now you, you better do better, brother. You better go higher than me. Psalm, Psalm, 90, <laughs> Psalm 96, verse 8 and 9, brother. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Bring an offering. Ah, uh, yeah, wait a minute now. Read it again. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. How? Bring an offering. And come into his courts. Oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Fear so, before him. So giving, giving to the Lord, 
brings him glory. You're, you're, you're not giving to bring yourself glory. You're not giving to build your future and your mansions and your bank accounts. You're giving to glorify him. That's the big difference with giving. And secondly, giving enables you to come properly into the courts. Read it again. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. And then. Bring a show offering and wait, come wait, into stop, his stop, courts. Stop, stop, Where did that Okaba show come from, brother? Well, did, 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 you, did you just re, read the Okaba show in there? I got excited about it. Got excited about my offering. Okay, would you please read the English and forget that Goreba. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Bring an offering uh -huh, and, and come into his court. So, so an offering, Mr. Goreba show, that's your name. That's your new name, Mr. Gopal Gopal Show. Anyways, I'm, just, I'm sorry. He, he makes me laugh. He interrupts the flow with his Olga Show, whatever he said. It's okay. It's okay. So it says an offering enables us to come properly into the courts. But then it says something else. Oh, worship the Lord. In the beauty of holiness. Uh, it completes worship. Because mm. it's all tied up together. So number one, when we give, we give him glory. When we give, we are enabled to properly enter his courts. And when we give, we complete our worship with giving. Hallelujah. Lift your hands and thank you for what's coming your way. Come on. The ocean is coming, remember? The ocean is coming. The blessings of God are coming your way with such abundance. Such glorious abundance. Help me there on the instruments, please. With such abundance, it's beyond, way beyond. Dear choir, get ready to sing something, will you? Where's that list, dear, dear Pastor Chris? Where's that list, please? I want you, yeah, uh, please stand up. You know what? You are so good, I'm going to take you with me in my luggage. Stand up. <laughs> I'm going to have to buy a lot of luggage. Anyways, lift your hands and pray in the Holy Ghost. Come on. Thank, thank God for what he's, he's about to bring your way. Hallelujah. 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 Blessed be your name. I want you to sing Monarch of the Universe. Because you're going to reign with him there. Did you hear what I said? He is the king of the universe. You're going to reign with him one day. And I'm asking you to get to the phones. I'm asking you to right now do what the Bible says. Let's give him glory. Let's tell him that he can trust us with more in the spirit. Higher places in the spirit. Jesus said, if you cannot be trusted with filthy mammon, who can trust you with true riches? Hallelujah. True riches are coming your way. Greater days than you've ever known in your life. I'm going to tell you something. Only you who are givers will be taken care of in this life, in the natural. The day will come. Trust me, the day will, the, the day will come. God will multiply everything you touch. Just like that meal of the little boy in Galilee. Things will show up in your life that have never been there. God Almighty will do the incredible. The most amazing things are coming to you. But let's finish well. Stronger than ever. Better than ever. Stronger than when we began as believers. In all we do for him, in our loving, in our serving, in our worship, in our ministry, and in our giving for his glory, only for his glory. Give what is due to him, to glorify him, it says in the Psalms. And then he said, coming to his courts with an offering and worship 
in the beauty of holiness. So get to the phones now and say, Dear Jesus, I love you. Express your love through giving. Express your adoration through giving. Right now, do it. Nothing, nothing will stop the blessings from coming your way. There's a, there's a great anointing flowing here. Do you feel it? It's flowing here. This is the time to sow. This is the time to say, Lord, I worship you and love you. I'm not connected to this world. Every time you give, you declare, this world is not my home. No, I'm not attached to the things of the natural. You call that number and do it. While the choir sings, monarch of the universe. Come on, let's go. Calling. Keep giving.
Hallelujah. Would you just lift your hands in the presence of the living God? For He is great and greatly to be praised. Lord Jesus, to you the glory and the honor belong. And we thank you for your presence. Thank you for the integrity of your word and we thank you for the intelligent Holy Spirit who is with us and in us thank you for these moments in purpose and destiny grant unto us now that we might speak as the oracles of God to the heart of the matter, to the center of the things which concern your people, for they are your inheritance in the earth. In the name of Jesus, and if you agree with that, just say, it is time of ministry and to Pastor Benny, how we love you, sir, and appreciate you and thank God for your life and ministry and to 
these other great men of God that have already been saluted who are friends and brothers both. We want to share something that I believe uh, is significant in this moment, and I believe it is not only apropos to the things that Pastor Benny was sharing and the level of ministry that he was dispensing, but I believe it is significant in a very practical way because I believe with all of my spirit that this week uh, the spirit of grace wants to take us somewhere. I believe God is desiring to get his church globally to a certain place, not geographically, but spiritually. And when I had the privilege on yesterday of sharing at the great uh, Love World Convention Arena, when I was standing there, uh, Pastor Kay, I, I saw uh, a, an advert, I saw a piece of material that talked about five days of destiny, five days of destiny, and I believe these, these are those days that we are in as they have been announced uh, and declared, and I, I am convinced that all this week, destinies are going to be affirmed, they are going to be confirmed, I believe some will be corrected, destinies will be corrected, I believe things will be brought to fruition because I am certain, as Pastor Benny was sharing, that the Spirit of God is wanting to bring His people to a level of not only understanding, but a level of moving with Him in cooperation with His plans and purposes in these uh, last days. And so I want you to go with me to Genesis 22. I want to begin reading there uh, because the Spirit of grace impressed this upon me very uh, strongly as I was inquiring of him what my part would be. And I'm always uh, amazed at how the thread of the Spirit amongst these brethren always ties things together. And even though we do not converse or dialogue or talk about what we shall share, the Spirit of God always brings it together in a magnificent way. I want you to read with me verse number 9, Genesis 22, and we're dropping into the encounter of Abram, uh, Abraham with, uh, with God uh, in the 22nd chapter of the book of Genesis as he is preparing to, uh, to sacrifice his son Isaac at the direction of God. And it's a very interesting thing. We know uh, that ultimately he does not perform that sacrifice. It's always been interesting to me, uh, uh, Bishop Dan, that, that God gives Abra Abraham this instruction. Uh, God is not a God of human sacrifice. He's, he's not a God of child sacrifice. And yet he gives Abraham this instruction. And so we're going to drop right down there and we'll read. Then he came, then they came rather, Verse 9, to the place of which God had told him. Will you say that out loud after me? The place of which God had told him. Yeah. Then they came to the place of which God had told him, and Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order, and he bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And so he said, here I am. And he, that is God, said, do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. Very interesting there before I... I read on, one of the things that always impacts me about this is most Christians would have killed Isaac because God told them to. Uh, what we have here is a God of progressive revelation, a God who continues to speak. One day he says this to Abram, Abraham, the next day he says don't do it because God is up to something. Wave at me if you understand what I just said, if you're in here, okay. And so he says, for now I know that 
phrase also impacts me greatly every time I read it because we're dealing with an omniscient God who now tells this man, now I know. So has God just discovered something? Has God just found something out? If you read the, uh, the, the text in the original language, what you find is when God says here, now I know, what he's actually articulating, uh, this word no means to ascertain by seeing or something seen or demonstrated as an action that causes or releases something else. So when God says, now I know, he's not saying, now I have found out something about you, Abraham. He is saying, in essence, now by your action, you have released me to get involved. You have actually released me to begin to perform what I have purposed. Now I know that you reverence or fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked and there behind him. Everybody say there behind him. Also important. There behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horn. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of Isaac his son. And Abraham called the name of the place the Lord will provide or Jehovah Jireh or yad heh Yireh. He calls the name of the place the Lord will provide. Everybody say the name of the place. He called the name of the place the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. And the angel of the Lord called Abraham a second time out of heaven and said, by myself, I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing. This, 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 because you have done this thing. The inference being, without this thing, some other thing wouldn't be happening. I need you to pay attention to God's word. Because you've done this thing, stay with me. Because you've done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, blessing I will bless you. What an interesting construction of language, both in English and in the original Hebrew. Blessing, I will bless you. And multiplying, I will multiply. It's very interesting because God could have said, because you've done this thing, Reverend Tom, I'm going to bless you. God could have said, Pastor Kay, because you've done this thing, I'm going to multiply you. But what God actually says is, because you've done this, blessing, I will bless you. And multiplying, I will multiply you. What he's actually communicating is, because you have done this thing, I will not be able to bless and exclude you. I will not be able to multiply and you not get in on it. In other words, you have made yourself indispensable to my cause and to my move. If anything is going to happen, you're going to be included. You're going to be in on it. How about you say, I want to be in on it. I want to be in on whatever God is purposed to do. And so what just happened here, he says, blessing, I will bless you. Multiply, I will multiply you as the stars of heaven, as the sand of the seashore, and your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. And in your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. I was reading this not long ago, uh, Pastor Chris. And as I was reading it, the, the spirit of the Lord arrested me. And he said, son, pay attention to my words. He said, the Bible says Abraham called the name of the place Jehovah Jireh. And the Spirit of Grace said to me, he said, Son, Jehovah Jireh is not just a covenant name of mine. It is that. And don't get me wrong. Don't misquote me. Jehovah Jireh is one of God's covenant names. But the Lord said to me, he said, Notice what I wrote here in the Scripture. He says he called the name of the place Jehovah Jireh, and the Spirit of Grace said to me, he said, son, Jehovah Jireh is not just a covenant name of mine. Jehovah Jireh is a place in me. It, it, it is a spiritual location in our walk with God. It is a place that you get to 
in God as you walk with him. And notice what he says. He says, uh, he called the name of the place Jehovah Jireh, as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord, at a certain place of elevation, at a certain place of of revelation, you begin to see all your need is met. Everything you have is from God and nothing that you need will you ever lack again. You begin to see that your God is an inexhaustible supplier. Ah, you will not lack or want for any good thing. You, you get to the place, Jehovah Jireh, even if you have a major need, even if you have a significant conflict, even if you have something that is staring you in the face and defying you, you don't sweat it, you don't worry about it, you don't stay up at night, you don't, you don't contemplate failure because you know that 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 you know your need is met. It is a place. Somebody say it is a place in God. And look at your neighbor and say, and I'm going there. How about you? I'm, I'm on my way there. Now many, many are there. Many, many are there. Many are there. And, and God, I really believe this with all my spirit that it is the will of God that in these last days, his sons and daughters all collectively come into this place where we are absolutely certain that no need will go unmet. No Goliath of lack will be able to intimidate us. No circumstance or situation will be able to, to, to intimidate us. And I really believe with all my spirit, that's what the place that Pastor Benny was talking about, where we're at a place where the material needs are, are, are paled in the light of the glory of God and the purpose of God for us in these last days. I don't know about you. I'm on my way, and I want to land there in the name of Jesus. I believe with all my spirit that there are men and women watching me tonight. There are men and women listening to me tonight that are going in these next several days are going to arrive at that place. I believe there are pastors and ministers, apostles and prophets and teachers throughout the nations that are going to land in this place and many of God's people as well. Now, the question is, how do you get there? Because the Bible says very it's clearly that Abraham came to the place God had told him. It's also interesting to me if you read verse number 13. It says, Then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and there behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns, and that is the ram that he sacrifices in place of his son. Very interesting uh, that it is the ram caught by the horns that is a type of, of the substitutionary sacrifice. A lot of people don't understand why the Hebrews blow the shofar, which is a ram's horn. Every time a Hebrew sh uh, uh, blows a shofar, they are heralding the reality of the substitutionary sacrifice that Yeshua is. That's why it begins every feast and every festival. It is a ram's horn. Now stay with me because I'm going somewhere with this, how does Abram get there? And the Spirit of the Lord said to me, He said, Son, the, the, there, there are elements of getting to this place, and I want to show you, and I want you to share a few of these elements with my people. I will not be able to exhaust them all, but I will get to the three major things the Spirit of grace had me to share with you. Go with me quickly to uh, Genesis chapter number 11. Let's go back to Genesis 11 very quickly. I want you to see something there. Genesis chapter number 11. And I'm going to read just the last couple of verses of Genesis 11. And then I'm going to go into Genesis 12, which is very familiar to most Bible readers and most believers. But I want to read in Genesis 11 first, verse 31. And it says, And Terah took his son Abram and his grandson Lot, the son of Haran, of his daughter-in-law Sarai, 
the son of Abram's wife, and they went out with them from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to the land of Canaan. And they came to Haran and dwelt there. So the days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. Genesis chapter 12, verse number 1. Now the Lord said to Abram, this is after his father Terah dies, and we've just been told that, that, that uh, Terah and Abram is of Ur of the Chaldees, of Mesopotamia, and so he is now about to encounter this God, Jehovah, this God, El Shaddai. His father is dead, and so after the death of his father, the Bible says, that the Lord said to Abram, get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you, make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you, and in you, all of the families, in the Hebrew there is mishpaka, which doesn't mean just everyone who comes from your loins or your lineage. It actually means everyone who comes into your class or into your order. Not class like upper class, lower class, middle class, but class like university class or school class. Everyone who begins to learn to function like you. Everyone who begins to walk by the principles I will reveal to you. Everyone who is of your faith. Everyone who begins to act upon my word like you. I will bless all the families of the earth. In it, are you listening to me? This is why Jesus said, go and make disciples, uh, disciplined followers of every Nation, ethnic group, why? Because anybody, black, white, yellow, red, who learns to walk by the principles of the word come into Abraham's family. Abraham's class according to the spirit. And so he says, get away from your country and from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. And therein is the first element of getting to the place Jehovah Jireh. The first element of getting to the place Jehovah Jireh is separation. It is a separation from that which is familiar, from that which is known. God did not tell Abram to get away from his family, his father's house, his country, because God didn't like Abraham's family. He didn't tell him to leave because he didn't like his country. He didn't tell him to get away because he didn't like his kinfolk. Some of you may not like your kinfolk, but God loves them anyway. No, he didn't tell him to separate because of dislike. He told Abram to separate because Abram has just encountered this great God, Jehovah. He has just come into relationship with El Shaddai. And God has a purpose for Abraham. And what he's saying to Abraham is, I am separating you for the purpose of getting some things into you that when I tell you to do them, when I tell you to act on them, I cannot have your mama or your kinfolks in your ear telling you this won't work. That won't happen. Nobody in your family, Abram, has ever done this. Nobody in your, uh, in your lineage has ever done this. You've got to understand something. If you and I are going to get to the place, Jehovah Jireh, if we're going to walk in that place with God, we have got to separate ourselves from the beggarly elements of this world, the principles of this world, and learn the principles of the kingdom of God. God and the separation is for the purpose of revelation. I'm going to say that again. The separation is for the purpose of revelation. Whenever God is going to take you or I to another dimension or another level, 
he will oftentimes begin to remove things from around us and move us away from things. Why? Not because he doesn't necessarily like our environment, but because he does not want anyone interfering with his instruction, his communication, and his revelation to you. Is anybody listening to the preacher? He says in Isaiah 55 and verse 8, my thoughts are not your thoughts. And my ways are not your ways. What is God saying? The way I get things done and the way you get things done are not the same. The way I prosper you, the way I increase you, the way I cause you to walk in victory and the way you would do it are not the same. And so he separates Abraham. Now what happens when he separates Abraham? He begins to walk with him in the day-to-day -day elements and attributes of his life to the degree, this is so glorious, to the degree that Abram begins as he walks with God before the conclusion of the 12th chapter of the book of Genesis where Abram has just met God. Before the conclusion of that chapter, the Bible says in verse number 8 that Abraham moved from a place where there was famine. He pitched his tent in Bethel on the west of Ai, and there he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. He's just met this God. He's not been, he's not been walking with him for years, Pastor Benny. He's, he's not been going. There is no synagogue to go to to learn about him. There is no church to attend to learn about him. Abram is walking with God. And as he walks with God, God is giving Abram principles, instructions, concepts, ideas. As God says, my ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. But as, my, as, the, as the snow comes down from heaven and the rain and waters the earth and returns not there but makes it to bring forth in bud that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be. What did God just tell you? When his word comes down, his thoughts come down. When his word comes down, his ways come down. God's thoughts and God's ways are in his word. Why is that important? Because the word of God and the instruction of God when it is given to us is the means and the mechanism by which we get from where we are to wherever God wants us to be. You get nothing in this kingdom by pursuing it. Everything in this kingdom is appropriated by pursuing him. I'm going to say that again. You get nothing in this kingdom by pursuing it. Everything in this kingdom is procured by the pursuit of him. Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things that the Gentiles, all these things that people with no covenant with God seek will be added to you. He didn't even say you'd have to work for it. He said it'd be added to you. So Abram begins to walk with God. I want you to see something here that's powerful. Abram begins to walk with God. And two chapters after Abram has met God, we see Abram, oh, just don't miss this. We see Abram do something that no one else in Scripture has ever done. We see Abram act and take an action that no one else in Scripture has ever done. Let's go there real quickly. Go to Genesis chapter 14. And for the sake of time, I will not rehearse the totality of the event, but most of you that are listening to me are aware of the fact that Lot goes with Abraham. Lot is Abraham's nephew. Lot is captured. His things are captured. There's a war in the land, four kings against five. And in that warfare, Lot, Abram's nephew, 
is taken captive. Abram goes with 300 plus of his own household. I love this story. 300 bakers, butlers, and chauffeurs <laughs> trained in his house. Somebody say under the anointing. Somebody say under the blessing. See, there's a testimony right there. When you got people under the blessing, you can beat whole armies. You may not look like you have enough, but if you've got people trained under the blessing, you can do supernatural things with less than people expect. The Bible says Abram went with men trained in his own house and took Lot back, got all his stuff back, and once he has the victory, let's drop down Genesis 14, verse number 18. The Bible says he, after the defeat, and he has gotten the spoil back, not only lots, but the spoil of that warfare. It says, verse 18, then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of the Most High God. So this is the priest of the God Abraham just met a couple of chapters ago. Are you in the room with me or what? He's the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, Bless me, Abram of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and bless me, God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he, that is Abram, gave him, that is Melchizedek, a tithe, a mahasra in Hebrew, a tenth of all. Bishop Payne no one had ever done that. No one had ever tithed. Are you listening to me, choir? No one had ever given God that we know of in Scripture a mahasra. Now, the principle of a portion designated to God goes all the way back to the garden. In, in, in Adam, it was the tree. In Cain and Abel, it was the first. In Noah, it was the seven clean animals that he sacrificed after he came out of the ark. But no one had ever mahasra. No one had ever tithed. So this is something. I need someone to hear me. This is something that God gave to Abraham. Between Genesis 12 and Genesis 14. And we know that he did. Watch this. Because when the king of Sodom approaches Abram and says, listen, you don't have to do this. Just take all the stuff and keep the goods for yourself. Look at verse number 22. It says, but Abram, Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have raised my hand to the Lord God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, that I will take nothing. In other words, Abram is saying this. There was an encounter between him and God that is not recorded in Scripture. Where God told Abraham, now this is a principle of walking with me. This is a principle of the blessing. This is a principle of increase. That you bring me the mahasra, you bring me the tithe. It is amazing to me. Especially right now, Bishop Payne in the, in the church in the West, Pastor Chris, right now in the church in the West because there is an emphasis on the message of grace. There are preachers and pastors who are telling their congregations that they don't need to tithe, that tithing is under the law. Tithing is old covenant. I want you to pay attention to something. God gives to Abram the principle of tithing before there is a covenant. I need you to hear me. He doesn't cut covenant with Abram till the next chapter. That's uh, Genesis 15. So before there is a covenant, old or new. Are you here? Before there is a covenant, old covenant or new covenant. Galatians tells us that the law was added some years after because of transgression. And the law being taken away cannot annul the promise or the covenant God made. And so the tithe, giving to God, is a basic foundational principle 
of walking in the blessing. I need you to hear me. Don't you let anybody convince you. Don't you let, I don't care if they've got a diamond stick pin and a pinky ring. I don't care if they've got five degrees. Don't you let anyone convince you that the tithe is old covenant or the tithe is under the law. The tithe is before a covenant was even made. Which means, mm, which means this principle of offering to God is so foundational and so fundamental to walking in the blessing of God that before God even makes a covenant with Abraham, he talks to him about this. And Abraham says, listen, I've already raised my hand to God. I don't care what you say. This God who told me he would bless me and increase me told me to do this. A lot of people say, well, you know, we don't have to tithe and I'm not preaching on tithing, but I'm in it, so I might as well stay in it for a minute. A lot of people say, well, you know, we're, the Bible says, if you don't tithe Malachi 3, you're cursed with a curse. And because we are already blessed in Christ Jesus, then we cannot be cursed with a curse. Well, you're almost right. You, you, you know just enough scripture to be dangerous. Because the covenant is not just that you will be blessed. The covenant is that you will be blessed and be a blessing. So just because you are blessed in Christ Jesus doesn't mean that you are continuing to be a blessing to other people. You cannot be a blessing without giving. You didn't hear what I just said. You can be blessed without tithing. You can be blessed without sowing, but you cannot be a blessing without tithing. And you cannot be a blessing without sowing. And if you are not a tither or a sower, the reality is you're selfish. And you're just thinking of your four and no more. God wants you to participate with him in blessing the whole earth. You missed a good place to yell. I said you missed a good place to yell. If you study the origin of the curse, the word curse actually means to have the disregard of. In the original Hebrew, there are two Hebrew words, arar, morar. It literally means to have the disregard of. If you notice, oh God, I didn't mean to get into this. If you notice, when Adam breaks the principle of honoring God with the tithe, are you there? God says to Adam, cursed is the ground for your sake. Notice, he doesn't curse Adam. He can't curse Adam because he's already blessed Adam. And not even God can curse what he's already blessed. So he says to Adam, cursed is the ground in relation to you. Now why? Why? Pay attention. This is important. Why? Because God put the blessing on Adam. He did not put the blessing on the earth. Let me say that again. God did not bless the earth. He blessed Adam. And he expected Adam. Yeah, you're with me. And he expected Adam to take that blessing and bless the rest of the earth with it. And with the blessing, the earth had to respond to Adam the same way it responded to God. You're not listening with the blessing, the earth had to respond to Adam the same way it responded to God. And so when Adam broke the principle of honoring God with his substance, God said, now the earth has the right to disregard you. The earth does not have to respond to you the way it responds to me.
Are you getting this choir? That's why when Jesus got up in the hinder part of a ship in a storm and rebuked the wind and said to the wave, be still. The disciples scratched their heads and said, what manner of man is this? Here's the answer. It's the manner of man you and I are supposed to be if we walk in the blessing of God. Somebody say separation. Say revelation. What are you saying? If you and I are going to get to the place, Jehovah Jireh, if you and I are going to get to the place where not only are all our needs met, but we are absolutely certain that no matter what situation or circumstance we get into, the need will be met and overflow. We will be able to see it. We are going to have to learn to do what God instructs no matter who says. That's not for today. That doesn't work. That's not biblical. That devil is a liar. Do you hear me? And in this last day, God wants his church to know this is a part of getting to the place. Jehovah Jireh, the, the, the tithe, the mahasra, and the offering, the minka, the apportionment in Hebrew. These are God's manner of walking in the fullness of of the blessing. Oh, maybe tomorrow I'll talk a little bit about what that blessing actually is and how it operates. But here, hear me very clearly. Everybody's a separation. In other words, if you're going to get to the place, Jehovah Jireh, you've got to be willing to leave some things that look familiar. You've got to be willing not to lean to your own understanding. You've got to be willing to break away from normality, from mediocrity, from what everyone else is doing. Hear what the Spirit of God is telling you and do it. Everybody say separation. Everybody say revelation. God gives to Abram this revelation of honoring him with substance. Isn't this amazing? Before he makes covenant with him, he gives him this revelation. Before he performs everything he's promised. He gives him this revelation. Why? Because he's going to speak to him. Would you, I got people in here. Would you just lay your hand on somebody real quickly right now? If you're watching me and you're with somebody, lay your hand up on them. If you're by yourself, you can lift your hand up. But if you're talking to somebody, look at them and tell them in these next several days, the Spirit of God is going to speak to you to do some things that nobody in your family has ever done, that nobody in your lineage has ever done, that none of your business partners have never done, that you never learned in school. God is going to speak to you to do something. And when you do it, the blessing is going to break out all over everything you have. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. Woo. Hey, glory, excuse me. I'm almost finished. Hey, glory, excuse me. Hallelujah. And when he tells you to do it, doesn't matter if he tells you to do it in prayer, if he tells you to do it in Bible study, if he tells you to do it while I'm preaching or Pastor Dan is preaching or Bishop Payne is preaching or Pastor Benny or Pastor Chris or Mike Smith, whenever he tells you, do it. When, when God sends, you know, well, I don't know if I can hear God like that. Let me help you. <laughs> when God sends Elijah to the widow woman, he says, I have commanded a widow woman to sustain you. But when Elijah gets to the widow woman, it is clear she has heard nothing. Do I have any Bible readers here? It is clear that she has been told nothing. He comes to her and finds out. He finally identifies clearly by the Spirit which woman it is because there were a lot of widows in Zarephath. Jesus said that. So he's supernaturally led to the one that he's to minister to. Are you here? 
And then he says, listen, go get me some water. She says, okay, uh, man of God, I'll get you some water. Hey, 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 while you're going, go get me, get me a cake. Oh, man of God. Hey, wait a minute. Water, cool. I will, I'll give you some water, but I don't have any bread. Are you there? So clearly, she has heard nothing from God. You know when she hears God? When a man under the anointing of the Spirit of the Lord looks at her and says, Thus saith the Lord, go and make me a cake first. Then she heard God. And she moved. She heard God when a man under the anointing spoke to her. I'm almost done yelling at you, I promise. So you may not hear God tell you to sow this or that, but a man under the anointing of God may stand up here tomorrow night or Wednesday night or Thursday night or Friday and say, thus says the Lord. But you got to know, yeah, is if a man under the anointing says it, the glory of God is on that word. The power of God is on that word. The blessing of God is on that word. The anointing of God is on that word. When you act on that word, the life of that word will break out and hit everything you have. Somebody shout hallelujah. I'm finished. I got about three minutes. And then I'm going to give you an instruction, the last thing. We've already read it, so I don't need to go back. Well, I'll read one piece of it because it's important. Genesis 22. Abram, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Abram is told by God, oh, children, don't miss this. Because see, sometimes we read this stuff. And we just read past it, Reverend Tom. Sometimes we read it, Pastor Kay, and we just read past it. We don't put ourselves in the scripture. We don't understand that this is a man learning the ways of God just like us. So God tells Abram, okay, take your son, your only son. It's interesting he says your only son because Abram has another one. I don't have time. But what God is telling you is you can't just give God anything you want to give him. You got to give him what he asks for. When he asks for it, that's the only thing he'll accept. When he, you may have two or three of them, but if God says that one, that's the only one that is going to satisfy him. Just give me your son, your only son. Take him and offer him up. And Abram, has to walk with this son that he has believed for for years. A son that hadn't come for 24 years of waiting. And finally, when God speaks to him, another thing which I can't get into today, he receives him in a year's time. Now he's got to take that boy. God says, I want you to sacrifice him. Not him, God. Not my most precious seed. Not the very best thing you've ever given me. Not the greatest thing I've ever seen. Yeah, that. I want you to take your son. And I want you to offer him up. I believe with all my heart. I, I, don't, have, I don't have scripture right now to prove it. But I believe with all my heart. I believe when God found a man. Who would give his son? God was then to release. God was then released to manifest his son. Because when God finds a man in the earth who is willing to do in the earth what God is willing to do from heaven. <laughs> he will hold nothing. I'm almost done. The Bible says he said, take him, Abram does. And when he's about to slay him, God says, oh, you don't have to do it. You know what? Write this down. When you are willing to give God the very best that you have, God will see to it that you will never do without it. 
You didn't hear what I just said. When you were willing to give God the very best you have, God will see to it that you will never do without it. If you're willing to give God a $1,000 seed, he'll see to it that you'll never do without it. If you're willing to give God a car, he'll see to it you never do without one. Why? Because whatever a man sows that, I'm done here. The Bible says when Abram took the very best seed he had at the word of God. Everybody say at the word of God. And offered it. God said, because you have done this thing. I wanted you to say it. There is an action of elevation. Say this after me. There is an action of elevation. That once you act on it, once you perform it, you will be set in a place from which there is no return. I believe with all of my heart that this week, God is going to ask you and I to give him something that is that thing that is going to cause you to go into a dimension in God from which you will never lack. Here's what I want you to do. I've got just a couple of minutes. Listen to me. Give me a little music, if you will, son. Listen to me right where you are. I'm not going to tell you what to give. But I'm going to tell you by the Spirit of God, my time with God this afternoon, He said, I want you to tell every individual watching you that tonight God wants you to offer something to Him that represents your best. Your best. The best you have. If if you've got $100, $50, and five, the hundred's your best. If you've got 1,000 Naira, 500 Naira, and 200 Naira, the thousand is your best. I'm not going to tell you tonight what to give. I'm simply going to say to you that this week, the Spirit of God has set an appointment with your destiny. And if you will act upon His Word when He speaks it to you, beginning tonight, there are men and women under the sound of my voice that are going to be set in a place where you're not only blessed, you are a supernatural blessing. And you are increasing on every side. Right now, right where you are, I want you to get ready to sow and give into this great move of the Spirit. I believe the details will come on the screen even after we go off the air. Even when this meeting closes, the Spirit of Grace is going to be dealing with hearts and lives. Would you lift your hands all over this room right where you are right now? I want you, sir. I want you, ma'am. Under the anointing of the Spirit, you say, man of God, I haven't heard God say anything to me. Well, then let me just say this to you. Right where you are, I want every person under the sound of my voice who can in faith to get a seed, to get a seed, a seed and sow it that represents another level of giving to God. Even if it's a dollar more than you've ever given, even if it's a dollar more, a naira more, than you think you can afford. I want you to take a step of faith right now. A step of believing. Because I tell you now, and I am prophesying, as a prophet of God, I declare to you that this week, the Spirit of God is going to bring thousands of believers into the place, Jehovah Jireh, where there is not only no lack, but where there is No doubt, no concern, no anguish, no fear. When you're faced with an obstacle, I feel the Holy Ghost. When you're faced with an obstacle, when you're faced with a challenge, you will rest. You will rest knowing that you know, that you know, that you know, that you know there is no way. I will be made ashamed. As a matter of fact, I want you to lift your hands right now and say that there is no way. I shall be made ashamed. Say it out loud. There is no way I shall be made ashamed. There is no way 
I shall not come out of this. There is no possibility that you will lack anything you have need of as you act. As you act, as you act on the word of the Lord. Right now, right now, I want you to get ready to sow. I think the information is going up on screens. There are ways for you to sow. There are ways for you to give. Sir, I am talking to you. Ma'am, I am speaking to you. Young man, under the anointing of the Spirit of God, I am speaking to you. You may be the only one in your family, the only one in your lineage, the only one in your community, the only one in your village that steps into this place. But you, sir, you, ma'am, are stepping into it. And I have it on divine authority. You will never go back to a lower level. If you will act on God's word tonight and this week, lift up your hands. Father, I pray for every man, every woman, every boy, every girl, every family, every preacher, every apostle, every prophet, if there's passage, every man or woman of God that is overseeing the work of ministry in this hour. I pray tonight that not one person under the sound of my voice misses getting to the place Jehovah Jireh in the name of Jesus if you agree with it just begin to lift your hands and worship God just begin to lift your hands and worship the Lord just begin to lift them and worship the Lord these are your days of destiny these are your days these are your moments I know come, come on lift your hands and just pray in the spirit just a moment man of God I I'm going to yield it to you, sir. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Glory. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you sir. Dearest Shepherd. Thank you.
Make sure to join us again tomorrow. Beautiful sessions. And of course, right after, you have the opportunity to watch the previous sessions back to back. And then join us in the morning session and the evening session tomorrow. I pray that the seeds of faith that you give today we multiply it, return to you in a great harvest, and your faith will produce results in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lebro so caramande kila capra sede ke sedes. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We'll do that part of the chorus again and then we'll say good night to you. This is Love World USA, broadcasting 24 hours each day with unique and vital programming designed to inform, enrich, empower, and guide you into the higher life that is yours through our Lord Jesus Christ.